Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 12th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee. I'll begin by asking the clerk uh, to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Ms. Rebecca Busanski? Here. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Susan Box? Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is our public comment period. Uh, this is a time that we allot members of the public uh, th up to three minutes uh, to speak to the school committee. Um, and I have a list of folks who have signed up uh, to speak tonight. And the first person who is signed up on the list um, is R.J. Castaño. Is, uh, yes, if you could just um, step up to the podium and uh, just state your name and and address for the record. My name is RJ Castagno. I'm the regional manager for Durham School Services, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the company that's providing the transportation for the school bus. Um, I'm standing in front of you today to speak about some of the issues we had at the start of the school year. Um, to be blunt with you guys, it didn't start off exactly as to plan. Um, there's been some issues that have come up that um, has been brought to my attention by my team and working with the superintendent and his team. Um, we've addressed those issues. Um, we've made, um, I believe, appropriate um, changes to our system, to our plans, to our staffing, to our drivers, to accommodate the problems that have arised and to solve them. Um, going forward, the plan that we've implemented this last week uh, will be something that we'll use as a plan A going forward. Um, it involves bringing in other drivers from other CSCs for, um, for cover drivers to accommodate any issues and shortcomings we have as far as route accommodations. Um, in the last few days, we've used those solutions and those drivers, and I've seen um, a positive change. Uh, we're going to continue with those solutions until we have, um, you know, exactly where we want to be. And what we want to be at is that every CSC for Durham should be staffed at about 105 percent, 110 percent staffing. Um, until we get to that point, um, we're going to continue to use these cover drivers from the other areas. Those cover drivers will be the same drivers over and over. They're not going to be different drivers bouncing in and out, which will give us, um, you know, some comfort level as far as not being different drivers every day. Uh, those drivers are aware of their route. They run their routes each day so that they're um, able to do them on time. And that, um, you know, more so than anything else is just, I just want to apologize how it started off. And secondly, just kind of just confirm that, you know, myself and Durham um, are committed fully to making sure that, you know, the transportation for the kids is safe and a timely one. And um, that's really all I wanted to say. I just would appreciate the time here and uh, the opportunity to speak to the group. So thank thank you, you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate well, it. The next person who signed up to speak is Alice Melnick. Good evening. I'm actually talking about a bus issue as well, but um, a different topic. My name is Alice Melnick. My husband, Pat, and I live in Leeds. Our three children, <coughs> which includes their families and our six grandchildren, live next door and across the street from us in Leeds. Some or all of you may have read the article that my husband and I sent into the Gazette with some concerns about the um, idea that there are no seat belts on our school buses. Last year, when our two granddaughters, the children of my daughter Mary, who's sitting here with me tonight, um, began riding on the bus, I noticed that there were no seat belts when the, when the children got on the bus. And it became a concern of mine um, because there is so much emphasis on seatbelt safety for all of us as we ride in vehicles now, I, I was thinking a lot about the fact that there were no seatbelts and my husband and I even got more concerned when the children took a field trip to Springfield on the highway and the bus that they took to go down to the museum, and we're talking about kindergartners here, had no seatbelts. Ever since our grandchildren have been born, my husband and I have watched as our children spent, as our grown children spent so much time and effort putting their children into safe car seats. First they were facing back and then facing front, and then they went to the next level and then they went to booster seats. And there's been so much emphasis on it. Like today when I took my grandchildren to the Lilly Library for the little Spanish lessons they go to, 
the first thing they all did was put their seatbelts on, and when I went in to help them, they all said, Grandma, we know how to do it ourselves, and they, they buckled themselves in. It's my understanding that it's the law in Massachusetts that we all have to use seatbelts, and we can actually get fined if we don't, if we don't put our seatbelts on. And I can't help but wonder, with these little five, six, seven-year-old children riding in school buses, if God forbid there was an accident, that they would have the strength or the ability to be able to secure themselves and not get really hurt. I just can envision them bouncing out of their seats and getting, and getting hurt. It's a different, you know, when our children who grew up in Northampton went on the buses, there weren't seatbelts either. But now we're all so much more aware of how how much it saved lives and how important it is that it just seems to me that it's beyond time for us to be talking about um, seatbelts on the school buses at the very least for the children who are so young. And so I'm here to just ask you tonight um, to consider this issue. I know that there are fees that the children have to use to go on the bus. I know that despite the fact I said in the paper I don't want to have money come into it. I know that's always part of the part of the discussion, but there are fees for the kids to ride on the buses now, whether that could be used to put some seat belts onto the buses, or I don't know how complicated the issue is. But I'm just asking, and if you're not the people that I should be addressing this with, please bring that to my attention, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody else who, who I should be talking to. So I very much appreciate for your time tonight and um, I also want to thank all of you for all you do for the students not only for my own grandchildren but for all the students in Northampton you give up a lot of time and, and I know in our family we really appreciate it thank you very much Mrs. Melnick and you, you are addressing the correct body um, it's not something we can respond to tonight that's not really how this works but we obviously take all the public comment that we receive and under advisement and we'll um, and we appreciate you coming forward to reiterate this to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person who signed up is Sam Hopper. Hi, um, I'm Sam Hopper. I live on South Street in Northampton. And I'm here tonight to share some concerns I have that arose from public comments made by school committee members representing themselves as school committee members at a public meeting last week. These comments concern me because they demonstrate a lack of regard for a school committee's responsibilities, purview, and constituent representation. My first concern is a presentation made and echoed that the budget is not a big part of a school committee's responsibility. Mr. Kaufman rattled off a long list of things school committees do. Let me assure you I am well aware of the things the school committee does beyond passing a budget but I find it very troubling that the connection between the budget and the work the committee does is lost on some. Setting educational goals and policies, another core responsibility of a school committee, is undeniably linked to a, a district's budget. My next concern is the suggested solution by Dr. Voss to an issue we face in the most recent budget process. In order to avoid members with direct financial conflicts from recusing themselves if wall-to-wall -wall collective bargaining were to repeat in the future, Dr. Voss suggested the school committee could tell the union not to bargain that way. The suggestion that a school committee could or should dictate how a union bargains is an overstep. Additionally, even asking a union to bargain differently in order to resolve a problem that stems from the school committee and not the union is a, is a, gives the union a disadvantage that's undue. My final concern that stemmed from the school committee member public comment is the express belief that losing a ward rep during the budget process is fine because there are two at-large reps as well. As you know, each resident has three reps, a ward rep and two at large. The flippant suggestion that more than one, that more than one school committee member missing your ward rep during a budget vote is not a big deal is dismissive of what should be a democratic representative process. Thinking it's equivalent that some, re some residents have three reps while others only have two, especially during a process as important as the budget, is just plain false. Three is more than two. Um, I have one more thing to share that's unrelated but important. Today is Hunger Action Day, so it feels appropriate to invite everyone to an upcoming public health oversight hearing focused on food and public health. Um, it's going to be Friday, September 27th from 1 to 4 at Greenfield Community College. 
One of the panels will focus on food health, or I'm sorry, school food, and our wonderful food service director, Ms. Del Hanna, will be one of the panelists highlighting Northampton Public School programs like summer meals and breakfast after the bell. More details can be found on the events calendar page of uh, the Public Health Committee co-chair, Senator Comerford. Um, her website is senatorjoecomerford.org and there's also a Facebook event with more information. Thank you for the work this committee does and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. The next person who signed up this evening is Heather Brown. Heather Brown, I live on North Maple Street in Florence, and I'm here as the Vice President of NACE to just give you some feedback um, from members from the last couple of weeks. One, thank you for ratifying our contracts uh, last month. Um, and the most feedback that we've been receiving is on the two principal searches that are ongoing right now. And I just wanted to convey a couple of points. Um, one, that members would like to encourage that the process not be rushed and that we take the time that's needed to get the right candidates in both searches. Um, also, members have been hoping, uh, as we mentioned at our last meeting with Dr. Provost, that the advertising for the positions should be expanded beyond school, school spring, if that's possible, um, which is not entirely optimal for attracting possi a possible diverse pool of candidates. Um, we, I think, all have agreed in other meetings that we'd like to attract and retain candidates of color, and perhaps the positions can be posted in um, some, <coughs> some places that members have suggested. So I have a small list, and I'm sure you all have other places that you know we might reach out and post these, um, these positions. Uh, one was the uh, education or administ administrative departments of historically black colleges, perhaps, and other universities as well. Uh, there's a National Alliance of Black School Educators who has a website and a really active membership. Um, we talked to the MTA Alana group about such issues and wonder if um, you know we could all work together to maybe find out from them. And also, we know Mass Live has a, a, a Spanish newspaper, the El Pueblo Latino, that maybe we can advertise in there as well, um, and any other places that you know of that we may not have thought of. So uh, thanks for listening, and thanks for conducting those searches in a way that we all hope will be fruitful. Thank you very much. So that was the list that was uh, given to me. Is there anyone else who did not sign up who wishes to speak in public comment tonight? Oh, yes. Who's it? Oh, okay. That was, I saw a hand go up, but I think that was just Heather. <laughs> um, anyone else? Okay, great. Thank you very much to everyone who spoke. Um, so um, we, have, we have scheduled tonight um, uh, an executive session um, and then announcements and then we move to recommended actions. I was going to ask, we have a uh, discussion later on in the agenda uh, relative to contracts for professional development. Um, and I know that Dr. Cheevers is going to be available to talk about sort of the substance of those, um, but there have been some questions that have arisen about the actual um, uh, 30B uh, 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 bid process and all the related things to these contracts. So, um, Dr. Provost had asked that the city's um, chief procurement. Oh, sorry, that's the time. Um, your time's up. Sorry, uh, that the uh, city's chief procurement officer, Joe Cook, um, come tonight. Um, and out of the interest of time, um, because he uh, was given very short notice, I was wondering if we'd have the opportunity to have him um, speak to the school committee and address questions related to. Um, the procurement process as it relates to um, uh, those contracts for uh, professional development. So, uh, Mr. Cook, if you'd like to just come to the podium. Um. Hello, everyone. Um, you maybe just want to introduce yourself and your role and your background uh, with the city. Uh, my name is Joe Cook. I've been with the city 32 years doing exactly the same damn thing. <laughs> I've been the chief procurement officer for the city since 1987. I'm also a lawyer. Uh, came to this job right out of uh, law school. Um, I am published on the topic of Chapter 30B in, in Massachusetts uh, in the Mass Municipal Lawyers Association. They call me Mr. Procurement. 
<laughs> and if you, uh, on your way out, you go through the uh, main uh, vestibule on the blast, uh, brass plaque in there for the building committee, I'm the only person on that plaque that still works for the city of Northampton. Mm. Okay. So do you want to just, uh, I know there was a question about professional, the professional development contracts, and I wondered if you could just give us a, a background about professional development as it relates to 30B and also just the pr process and procedures for the thresholds involved? Uh, normally, uh, under 10,000, you use sound business practice for any procurement. Uh, over 10 and under 50, you would seek three written quotes. Over 50 would be either a advertised bid process or uh, a request for proposal process. Um, there is a long list of exempt topics in um, in Chapter 30B, you know, where you none of the requirements apply. Uh, snow plowing, uh, there's it's quite a an odd list of things. But uh, lawyers, doctors, um, architects have their own special process. Engineers, uh, if you're not involving a building, are completely exempt. And one of the things that is also exempt is uh, teachers for uh, professional development. For the uh, specific, the most recent uh, professional development contracts, uh, I met with Ms. Cheevers, the curriculum director, uh, about this. I, we discussed her procurement plan for these uh, two contracts. Um, she had a, a very good idea to uh, let us kick the tires on these uh, presenters. So instead of being locked into an entire $13,000 or $17,000 contract, uh, we could, after the initial presentation for each of these people, you know, if the, if the feedback was the information wasn't that good or it wasn't being presented in an effective manner, uh, we could say thank you very much and try something else. So we are really only locked into that very first class. Um, I, we worked back and forth with the contract language to make sure we were well protected. Uh, the people chosen uh, were well thought of, had excellent resumes, and um, I had no problem with the, the process given the amount of money involved. Um, you always want to spend more money uh, or spend more time when you're spending more money. These were very small contracts. They were for a limited time that we were making commitment. We had a chance to uh, vet these people in our own classrooms, make sure they were doing a good job. And so uh, I really had no problem with it. And I did go back and review those. Uh, I, I found out about this presentation at 4 o'clock today. But I did go back and read the, uh, the contracts and review my notes on the process. So if anybody has any questions about how, how we did these things, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Folks have any questions for, uh, for Mr. Cook? Um, you did say something to me, I just, because it was, every time I talked to you, I learned something new about procurement, which I suppose isn't surprising. Um, but when we talked um, earlier today, you said, in fact, that you actually can't do an RFP unless a contract is worth 50000 or more. Right. The uh, RFP process is reserved for very large, you know, over 50000 which is not huge, but it's, we're not allowed to use that under $50,000. And we've used that process very, very rarely because it is much more time intensive. Uh, there's almost always a way to put together an invitation for bid process that will get you in the same place but save you know, hundreds of hours of staff time. And RFP is very labor intensive. Okay. So are there any other questions that people may have for the chief procurement officer while he's here about this topic? Mr. Kaufman. Sure, thank you. And thank you for coming. I was one of the ones that had some questions, so I, I appreciate your time. And sure. it sounds like you know you're the right person to talk to. So if I can just throw off some questions, I think it would be helpful to get some clarity. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, well, first of all, I know that I know that an RFP process isn't required, but we could, if we if locally we w we, f we wanted to incorporate an RFP process, we certainly could, couldn't we? For this particular type of contract with professional development, since there are no requirements, you could do anything you want. Right. Okay. And it would take hundreds of hours of staff time to do sure. it. Oh, that was a huge downside. I, I, yeah. You would um, spend more in staff time than you would on the entire right. procurement, not to mention <coughs> the savings you might make. Right. 
So if in this particular situation where we're, um, and we've done this many times, and I spoke to Dr. Provost about it, so I have a much better understanding, thank you. But if under 30B, which is um, this going, uh, funding professional training or professional development of staff does not fall under 30B, is that correct? Right, it's exempt. exempt. So what does it fall under? Is there some guidelines? I mean, Shirley, are you saying that we could spend as much money as we wanted for professional development without any oversight? It, just seems, it seems odd to me that there wouldn't be some law, some guidance, or guidelines that we should be following. Uh, there really is no set of guidelines for the procurement part of it. Uh, there's rules against, uh, you know, there's the state ethics laws, so we, you know, you, you couldn't, we couldn't hire our brother-in-law to do these contracts. Um, but, and there is oversight, of course, the superintendent, this committee, the mayor, I, I read every contract, whether it's under my purview or not. Yeah. The city auditor also looks at every contract. So there is a, you know, like four layers of people looking at this, and, uh, but there is no specific format you have to use for this. The only thing I would add from the financial side of it is that every, you can't even issue a contract unless you have a funding source and there has to be sufficient funding in the funding source. So you, could, you can't exceed what's budgeted in that line item. And exactly. The auditor is always checking. Right. Well, that's the function of the auditor is making right. sure that uh, when they come to our office, uh, our cover sheet has all the account numbers that might be charged for that account. And if there's not funds sufficient in, in any funding source, the auditor won't sign it. Yeah. And that, that happens very sure. rarely, but sometimes there's an oversight. So how do you, so the, the part that is a little bit uncomfortable for me would be um, if we spent what I think I think in this particular case the professional development that we were that we were told about I think it was a thirty thousand dollar contract. So in my world that's a lot of money. I understand that we some people have dealing with much larger contracts, but I do think that's a lot of money that needs some oversight. So I was concerned that we went with a vendor that. Um, we didn't, we didn't know whether they were the, the best and the cheapest. I know there's a lot of factors in the decision making and sometimes the cheapest isn't the best and RFPs allow one thing and other bid processes just go with lowest, lowest bid. And there's a variety of complications there and I've been in this business and I know the downside. But all that said, if we, if we contract with a service provider in this case, 30, and what you're telling me it could be 5 million, because there's no limit on it. How do we as school committee members, um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm asking for advice, but how do we live up to our fiduciary responsibilities by, if, we, if we're responsible for oversight of the budget and we do have a process in place for kind of approving contracts, and I don't know if it goes far enough, do you have any advice? Like, what do we do when, if we feel like the money, if we need to respond to our constituents who might see this and they ask us, why did you spend $30,000 when there might have been someone just as good for 20000 or 15000 and they had somebody in mind, for example? You're referring to the two contracts combined, correct? Yes. The, okay, the two separate contracts. Okay, Thank you. just making sure. Uh, reviewing the contracts that are on your list for signature and approval is certainly, uh, and asking questions of the staff about you know, who did they look at, how many people's resumes did they review, would be a good way to uh, vet these things yeah. if you have any questions. Right. And I'd always, my door is open every single day for a school committee member. So yeah, I appreciate that. So are you saying in this particular case, since I, I wanted to ask you since you looked it up and it sounds fresh on your mind, so did we look at other potential vendors for this one? Uh, my uh, recollection of my conversation with Ms. Cheevers is that they uh, reviewed the resumes and called around and asked other, you know, the people on listed on the resume what their uh, experience was, and everybody was highly re reviewed. And I was very much reassured that, you know, if this person you know, who supposedly does a very good job, yeah. doesn't actually do a good job, they're gone after one session. So well, not much I, 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 just, I just want to be clear. I think that the people we chose, but my every factor that we have, and we're going to get a presentation from, from Dr. Chiefers later, sounds like fantastic people. And it sounds like the results were great. I just want to separate that from the discussion. I'm talking strictly from a budgetary standpoint and our responsibility is to provide oversight for the budget. That it just sounds like we have no we have no say in how we're going to spend money 
in this case, it was a total of 30, but you're saying 30B doesn't even require a bid to go out if, as long as it has to do with professional training. I just, I guess I'm surprised by that. If I'm glad we're following the law, uh, I think maybe as a, as a committee, we need to have a discussion as to whether we're comfortable with that or whether we need to initiate a policy above and beyond that to ensure that Dr. Provost is protected and we're protected if we're approving it or not approving it. But I, I really appreciate you clarifying that we're not breaking the law, that's good to know, and that there's a process in place, um, I think, above and beyond that. I, you know, I, I, I don't have any other questions for you. I would just like to add that the, the level of effort for this is appropriate, um, given the amount of staff time we all have to devote to various projects. And yeah. you know, time we take away doing extra work on this means we don't do something else. So uh, given the dollars involved and the protection of having the right to immediately cancel this contract, uh, gave me a lot of comfort that you know this was being handled appropriately. But you can always vote no, and that's the way you can exercise your, your due diligence in, in reviewing this sort of contract. Any one of these contracts, right. you can but just we, vote we no. We do go out to bid, like where I think later on tonight or last week, we went through a bidding process for the um, bus drivers contract with that. So that, I assume, is not an exemption, but we do it, right? And we spend the hours that's required. Do you see a difference? Between right. It's a $5 million contract for school buses. Yeah. So it's huge. And it's uh, much more involved with you know, school safety, yeah. you know, the student safety. It's, it's an enormous contract. It's yeah. one of the biggest contracts in Northampton. So right. we spend a lot of time. Right. No good. So you, in that case, you're saying it had to do with the amount of money and the importance of it, given student safety or whatever. I totally agree with you. Yeah. But in the case of the professional development, it didn't rise to that level in your mind? No, not for that size contract where we're only committing maybe $1,400 really to a contract. And we can you know, cancel it any time. It seemed like we were well protected by just being able to have the experience of having the person teach a class before deciding to keep going with that person. Before I turn it over to Dr. Ross, I just want to add to that too. I think the other the other safety in this, and I'm someone that deals with contracts all the time, and we have a budget, and I have is that we hire professionals, um, you know, in this case a curriculum director, um, to actually go out and seek out professional development and to work with teachers to arrange for professional development. So that I mean that's also, you know, at work here as well. So there's a certain level that we also hire people that we empower to do some of these things. So, and that happens all the time. So, because um, there are contracts like this all throughout the school district that whether it's school, whether it's school lunches, whether it's maintenance, whether, you know, that are happening all the time. So anyway, I just want to let that, that's one other fail safe we have is making sure we're hiring good staff that are on top of that and that are being supervised. Mm -hmm. Dr. Voss, did you have questions? Um, I did, and thank you very much for sharing that. I wanted to, tell my fellow school committee members and others that I, I do have a question for you and this is just okay. a little bit of a preface. Um, approving, getting this information about this contract in the email presented problems for me that were new and I think it has to do with some of our policies and we can't um, talk about those policies because of open meeting law. So this meeting presents the opportunity for us to be able to say what um, didn't work for us. So that's partly why I asked for this to be on the agenda. And I'm really glad it's separated from the actual professional development because my questions were not about who we hired or the work they did. It was about how we got to the position we were in that we were all in at the end of August when we got this email. And, you know, thank you for being here tonight. One question I have for you, but I also have a question for the whole group um, that's beyond uh, you, Mr. Cook, is. Um, in the original email we got, it said that it was originally thought that no contract was needed. And I'm just curious a little bit about the timeline, when the procurement started, when we knew we were entering into these contracts worth the amount they're worth, and why we, 40 hours before the professional development was to start, were asked to approve something. I don't know that I was involved in the earliest stage of this conversation. I, I, when I became involved, a contract was contemplated. Uh, under $10,000, uh, the school department would not have had to uh, had a contract. 
uh, that is signed by the, the auditor, myself, the mayor, or the school committee. It would just be they could issue a, a purchase order. So at some point, uh, they decided, oh, this is going over 10000 We need a contract for it. Dr. Provost, did you want to? Yes, I think I can speak to that. It has to do with the sort of try before you buy aspect of this whole contract. My understanding is that when Dr. Cheevers was first developing the contract, it was for that first piece of professional development, which was below the $10,000 threshold. And then in getting guidance from Mr. Cook, correct me if I'm wrong, the concept of, well, maybe this relationship will extend into the year, which would bring it above the $10,000 contract, resulted in a recommendation that we should create a contract for greater transparency. And that came within the less than 48 hours before um, the, the first professional development activity was supposed to take place. Uh, thank you. That does jog my memory that uh, we, ha we had a discussion, or I had a discussion with Ms. Cheevers about um, for procurement purposes, we always look at what is the maximum we might spend with this vendor. You know, what do we in good faith know right now we're, we might want to spend with them? And she was envisioning this first smaller segment, but might want to continue with the same person. And I said, okay, let's look at that total dollar amount then. And that's when we realized it was over $10,000. And uh, even though it's exempt from any sort of competition requirements, uh, our local guidelines say at $10,000, we've got to sign a contract. So that was sort of the, I think that was the kerfuffle that Dr. Provost was referring to in his email, that it suddenly shifted to needing a contract based on that conversation. No, so, yeah. No, no problem. And then I think my other comment question for discussion um, is probably not a question for you, but it's very much on this topic. Um, maybe it is. Um, so when I got this email asking me to approve this, um, I was put in a really awkward position and I didn't understand if I had to approve it or not. Our policy says after reading it carefully, we have 48 hours to say no, we're not going to approve it. Well, professional development was starting in less than 48 hours and um, I certainly wasn't going to call off something that was so well planned and so important. Um, at the same time, uh, my real concern has to do with some of the things Mr. Kaufman articulated, which is not so much the total amount, but uh, what we're getting, what we're paying people for a, not very many hours of work. So we're eff effectively paying people at a rate of $500 an hour. And my fiduciary responsibilities to this committee and when our money is as short as it has been this year, trying to be really careful of it, that struck me as um, more than I wanted and I felt that we should have discussed it at our August meeting um, when you're going to pay contracts that cost that much. So I, I didn't like being in that position and I don't know what we can do about our policies but perhaps thinking ahead um, if we have this 48 hour window it, it was an ineffective window because we really had to make the decision in a much shorter time. So I see this as a situation that our policy didn't really cover in a way. I couldn't talk to my colleagues about it. I do think we're paying an hourly rate that, um, if it's appropriate, I would have wanted to see what other people charge in this case. And I just want to clarify uh, for the public and is that we, we aren't asking you to approve it by email. Because um, that would be a violation of open meeting law. We can't do you can't do online deliberation. The policy says that um, the superintendent is authorized uh, to sign contracts of a certain size. It get the contracts get shared uh, with the school committee, and any one school committee member has a right to say, actually, I want to put this on a school committee agenda. So you aren't people aren't being asked to approve it. They're just saying like, I want to. I want to invoke our right to not give the pre-approval process because we have lots of contracts and you know I think that week we've gotten three or four other contracts and so it's a it's really designed um, for smaller contracts where we basically said for small contracts we're going to empower the superintendent to sign on our behalf but as a fail-safe he will share with us a copy of the contract 48 hours and then we all have the opportunity to say, you know what, I think I want to put this one on an agenda so we can discuss it. So I just wanted to clarify that, that you weren't asking. Yeah. I mean, you could say I was approving it, but you weren't actually being asked to vote by email on the contract, because that, be, that would be bad. So, yeah. Thank you, yeah. and I agree. And that was, you said it more articulately than I did. Um, 
that is for me how this ended up on the agenda and moving forward I do want us to have a conversation about what is an appropriate hourly rate for people that we employ we, we're going to talk about lawyers later on the agenda and um, so that's how it ended up here. okay okay excellent any other questions um, for Mr. Cook anyway just so I'm good. Okay, I don't have any questions, Mr. Cook. Uh, again, I thank you very much. I feel better. Um, but I, I do wonder if we can continue this discussion. This is part of the agenda where we can continue this discussion as a school committee now. Um, or is this way We later? could. I was curious. Is one of the policies that's on the agenda tonight? Yeah. Okay. We're actually being asked to review and approve oh. the very policy that we're talking about is on the agenda yeah. later tonight. It's coming back, to <coughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Second reading and vote. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just saying it is on. If you want to talk specifically about that policy, that would seem like a good time to do it, um, since it's going to be coming up, and that's the chance yeah. to make changes that's to right. it. So, did you have a follow-up? Well, maybe you can help me differentiate. So I think there's two things. There's the policy that we're talking about, and there's also this issue that a school committee member with this policy you just quoted said, "I'd like this on the agenda because we are paying." at a rate that I want to talk about with yeah. other committee members. And I think that's going to be, I think, when we get to later in the agenda, when Dr. Cheevers okay. is going to talk to us about the professional development, um, as the person who is most closely involved with selecting these individuals, I think she will be able to fill us more sure. in about going rate and what the, you know, I think that would be a more appropriate okay. than for uh, sure. yep. uh, Mr. Cook. Um, great. Um, any other questions for Mr. Cook? If anything does come up, please, my office doors. All and again, I want to the thank committee. you on very short notice for coming over tonight. I, I yes. I do. So I, I don't, you mentioned a $1,400 threshold that you weren't worried because of 1400 I don't know what $1,400 refers to. Uh, the uh, one day of the time, like one of the presentations was about $1,400, I remember from the contract. So if that didn't go well, if we weren't happy with the information or how it's presented, we could say, oh, we're all done with this contract. Uh, we had the absolute right to just cancel it. So all we were at risk for was fourteen hundred dollars. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Cook. Have a You're good. You're very welcome. Nice to see evening. you all. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, Ms. Miss I don't know if I have a motion, but I have a question. Sure. I'm cognizant of the fact that we might be going into a report executive session now yeah and I'm wondering if the people who are here to present I don't know how long this executive session is but I, can we do those things or are those quick things we Barbara Black Josh yeah. Mistel and Michael sure. are those quick enough I, I, think I worry that we yeah. have long executive sessions yeah. okay to speak to that <laughs> sure so I I think we can do them fairly efficiently, but I do feel like I need to say on behalf of my other staff who are here for the executive session that that will be delaying them. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so there's people here that are here. For I like them well. better. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But that's fine. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's, so fine. That, that's the reason why. Okay. okay, so we have to make the executive session quick. Yeah, so uh, would you like to make the motion to make, make it quick? Yeah, and to, move into, uh, and to move into executive session, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, request for an executive session under Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, specifically to discuss the resolution of a union grievance involving a personnel-related matter. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So this requires a roll call vote of the school committee. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Mayor David Rockwitz? Yes. Ms. Molly Burnham? Yes. Ms. Rebecca Dusansky? Yes. Mr. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Yes. Mr. Lauren Coffin? Yes. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Ms. Susan Boss? Yes. Okay, so I just need to let the public that's here know that we will be moving next door into the library um, to conduct an executive session because to discuss these personnel matters in public would be detrimental to our uh, bargaining position and also to let you know that we will return back to this open session meeting. So we will not adjourn. We'll come back. So thank you. 
Uh, welcome back to the Thursday, September 12th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, we are now reconvening in open session after having been in executive session. We now move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, uh, the next item on the agenda is announcements. Are there announcements from members of the school committee? Ms. Hennessy. Um, as some of you know, as a member of the school committee, there's one member, and it's me, who's a member of the board of the Northampton Community Television, which is no longer Northampton Community Television, but rather Northampton Open Media. And on October 18th, you are all, as well as the entire public, is welcome to a um, relaunch um, party at, um, at their Holly Street um, facility. And again, it's Northampton Open Media. It'll be 6.30 to 9 o'clock, and they'll have presentations, some films, food and drink, um, and some music. So, Excellent. Ms. Busansky. <laughs> yes, as uh, the liaison to the Northampton Prevention Coalition, I just want to announce that um, they are having a health expo titled Hidden in Plain Sight on October 2nd from 6.30 to 9 p.m., also at Holly Street. And I think that they have really just done a great job of pulling together a lot of educational information. For It's for adults only so that parents, caregivers, community members can really learn about what are the signs, what are the day to, everyday signs that we overlook all the time that says that our kids are in trouble and, and need help. And so I really want to encourage people. I think it's going to be a great event and they are going to have snacks and prizes and in addition to everything else, but um, they're going to have a lot of really useful information, and you can just come whenever you want, walk through, and go, and just try to educate our whole community about how we can be sort of helping our kids and what we should be looking out for when they're in trouble. So, Ms. Fallon. Um, as the Vice Chair for Division 5 for the NISC, I just wanted to remind you all that on September 28th at 9 a.m., um, we're co-sponsoring along with the Minority Caucus and Division 9 um, a workshop called Becoming More Engaged and in Inclusive Educational Leaders, Pathways for Supporting Our LGBTQ Students. Um, it's free, but they, we ask that you register online so that we know how many people to expect. Um, and it's 9 to 12, September 28th. In Springfield. Yes. Any other announcements? <laughs> okay. Um, next, we have a few recommended actions on our consent agenda. We have the approval of the school committee meeting minutes of August 8th, 2019. Um, and we do not have any field trips and we do not have any budget transfers. So it's really just the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda is approved. We'll now move into reports and recommendations. And while it's not um, on here, uh, I did want to uh, take a moment to recognize our new student representative uh, to the school committee, Eleanor Harden. Um, who's joining us uh, this school year. Welcome, Eleanor. And if you wanted to just, um, typically there will be a report that you'll give, but if you want to just give a, introduce yourself and let the public know who you are and if you have any other words. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Eleanor Hardin. I'm a senior at Northampton High School. Um, I'm a member of the student union, and so this year I'm going to be the school committee representative for that group. Um, we had our first meeting of the year yesterday night. Um, I don't know if you want me to, I have a few notes if you want me sure. to yeah. discuss them. Sure. So some of the things that we talked about yesterday that we're planning on working on this year um, are, so I'll just kind of list those things. Um, we were really concerned about the vaping issue um, at our school and I think possibly at JFK um, given that like the recent, you know, um, news of you know all these like deaths and really serious illnesses resulting um, from this whole vaping thing um, you know it's becoming more of a concern we think and because it is such a prevalent issue at our school right now um, it's something that we really want to work on in the coming year um, you know we tried a little bit putting up posters you know talking with administration about it this past year uh, um, but we really want it to make it like a, a more um, serious issue for us to work on this year. Um, another thing, um, we're going to continue working on changing the sex ed curriculum for the wellness classes that we worked on last year. Both Community Waldman and Brayden Goggins are really working hard on that. 
So um, those are one of the, that's one of the things that we're going to keep working on. Um, another thing that we would really like to work on and, and keep a top priority this year is um, kind of working on and like just discussing and um, becoming aware of at least in the beginning stages of um, like the diversity and like diversity and achievement gap at our school. Um, last year we sent out a survey just asking students of Northampton High School what their main issues were and that was actually the number one issue for all students um, and it was something that last year kind of got you know lost and we didn't get to focus on it that much and so this year we'd like to focus on it you know a lot more and make that a top priority. Um, we're planning for that to reach out to the students of Color Alliance at our school and also um, Real, which is like a, yeah, I'm sure you guys know what it is. So um, those are some of like the beginning things that we're thinking of doing. Um, also, we endorse the climate strike for next Friday, the 20th of September, um, which um, a couple of our members are really working hard to um, work on that and develop that. Um, just some school-wide updates. We have our first football game tomorrow night. Um, auditions for the Romeo and Juliet play that's happening are, I think, next week. Um, and then there's the climate strike on Friday. Um, freshman elections for you know class officials and student union members are is next Tuesday. Um, last night there was a senior parents meeting, and also next Thursday there's going to be a financial aid meeting for those senior parents. So. Those are just kind of some updates about the school, what's going on there. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking of working on, and you know, definitely there'll be more like in-depth details to come. Thank you very much, Eleanor. We Thank appreciate you. that. We look forward to just having you serve with us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, next we have um, a report on the exciting farm to school grant, um, and I believe that. Um, What's that? Ms. Still had to leave. Ms. Still had, had to leave. Oh, Ms. Still had to leave. Okay. Is there someone else here? Michael. Oh, Mr. S Michael will be here to present on it. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Michael Skillcorn. I'm the director of programs at Grow Food Northampton. And as uh, I'm sure you all know at this point, we recently received an award from the USDA uh, for farm to school programming in partnership with uh, public schools. So it's very exciting, and um, I can answer any questions about that. I wanted to give a little background and context as to how we came to apply for that and get it first. Um, also, as many of you know, the school gardens have been happening here at the elementary school so successfully for maybe going on 10 years. Um, six years ago, Grow Food Northampton started bringing students out to the farm, Crimson and Clover, in our community garden. And three years ago, we started doing classroom cooking workshops during the winter in all of the elementary schools. Um, and then last year, with the hiring of Ms. Hanna, um, started to bring in more local food into the cafeteria and food service. So about a year and a half ago, myself and Ms. Pusansky and Ms. Hanna and Hope Gardnier, who's the uh, school sprouts coordinator for the school gardens, we got together and we sort of looked around and realized that there's a lot happening in Northampton Public Schools that can fall under this umbrella of farm to school. Um, we weren't calling it farm to school, I don't think. Um, and that is a term that basically encompasses anything that's connecting students to healthy food, either through the cafeteria, either through the classroom, through school gardens. Um, and we decided to try to bring everybody together who was participating in these farm to school programs or excited about them. So we organized a, a summit last April. We had a farm to school summit. We did not know how it would go. But it was, I think, immensely successful. We had, I think, over 50 people there, a complete cross-section of the community here for Northampton Public Schools. The superintendent attended. We had elected officials in um, Joe Comerford and Lindsay Savadosa. We had teachers from every level of the schools here. We had parents. We had city council people, um, school committee members as well. So we really realized that, wow, there is a lot of energy and excitement behind this idea of farm to school. Some people were involved in the different segments of it, but we all realized that we're all working towards similar goals. So from that experience, we got a lot of feedback from the group about what they would want to see in terms of the future, the vision for how Farm to School could go. So Grow Food Northampton, with uh, the public schools, uh, applied for this USDA grant 
to get some funds behind this work. And very excited that we were successful in um, getting awarded that. So it's a two-year grant for a little over $97,000. And the big buckets of money that it's going to support are continuing classroom workshops and field trips that Grow Food Northampton provides. Um, there is season extension equipment for all of the uh, school gardens at the elementary schools. Um, there is money for programming to extend the work up into the middle and high schools, which was a very clear priority for everybody at the summit. The elementary schools are the ones with the gardens and the programming that Grow Food Northampton does. Everybody wanted to see how can we keep that going so there's not a, just a cliff when students get to JFK or uh, the high school. So um, that's in there. And then a, a lar another large bucket is for food service. And Mistel is not here, but I can talk a little bit about um, her priorities. And that is first equipment. So uh, when she started here, she was thinking about making a butternut soup and realized that in the cafeterias, in the kitchens, there's no blenders to make soup with. So um, she has a small list of equipment items that will enable her to do more scratch cooking, um, buy more from local farms, whole vegetables that she can then cut up and make into food using new vegetable wedgers, um, and also professional development for her staff in order to learn how to make certain recipes or um, do more scratch cooking. Um, and then also staff support for her so that she can try to bring in more locally sourced food or promote or market her meals and hopefully increase participation in school meals. Um, and then the final piece of the grant is continuing to coordinate sort of this new network of stakeholders that are really interested in this work. Um, so that will be a piece of it. We'll be doing another summit. Um, there is a, a team from the district, actually not related to the grant, but um, that will be participating in a planning process called the, the Mass Farm to School Institute. And the superintendent is on that team, and Ms. Pusansky is on that team, um, Ms. Stell is on that team, and teachers from the elementary school, middle school, and high school as well. So what's exciting for me about that is that it's really putting the, the core of the planning of what's going to happen with Farm to School squarely within the district. Um, so it's not Grow Food Northampton or School Sprouts necessarily shepherding this, but really it's the district and people within the district taking ownership and, and, and um, moving this forward. So that will be happening over the course of this year as well. And um, yeah, I think that's all I got. So happy to answer any questions you have about it. Does anyone have any questions? about it or comments or concerns can I just add to it yes so I just really want to thank Michael and Grow Food Northampton for really taking the lead. Michael wrote the USDA grant. When we all sat down to brainstorm it, we really thought there was not a chance we would ever get it, which kind of frees up your thinking. That was fun. So <laughs> it was very exciting that we actually got the grant. And to be part of Mass Farm to School Institute, I think it's going to be great for us to have two days with such a power-packed group from the district to really think about and plan for farm to school. I'm really sorry that Ms. Delahanna had to leave because, you know, the stars have really aligned, but one of the biggest stars is Ms. Delahanna in this whole process, and she has really come into our district. Uh, she started a year ago, right, mm -hmm. and really brought all of this farm to school knowledge and interest and just enthusiasm with her. And one of the things she shared at the Farm to School Summit that I found striking just nine months into her tenure or less was that um, she'd moved the district from buying 2% local to 14% local. And that was with none of this extra sort of these resources that we really do need. So it's really exciting to think about, you know, how far we can go with this. So uh, just a big thank you to you, Michael and Grow Food Northampton, and to Mistel because we're very, I just feel very lucky to have her and help make move this whole thing forward. So it's great. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your leadership, too, Ms. Ansky, on this. Mm -hmm. Ms. Fallon? Is there any um, idea when the second part of the school summit will happen? Um, not specifically. We haven't talked spring. about it. Next spring. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I think at this point, the, the team that is assembling for this Mass Farm School Institute will be the core committee, essentially, that is planning these things. And I am the coach of that team, so I'll be there helping to facilitate. Um, uh, the institute is happening in mid-October. So we will talk more about um, the year's plans and when the summit can happen. We did it in April, April 6th uh, yeah. this year. So, yeah. 
Mr. Moore. Yes. This is a question, I'm really sort of passing on a question that somebody asked me the other day. Um, is there any either current or plans for collaboration with UMass in terms of either their food service or their ag school? Um, it's definitely been floated. There are no that I know of current plans on how to go about doing that. Um, we do know some folks that work in food service, for example, that we can reach out to. Um, but no specifics at this point. Yeah. Mr. Coffin. So um, I want to join everybody in thanking you and thanking um, the various people that were involved. Um, Dr. Provost, it sounds thrilling that you were involved in some of these meetings and stuff. And so do you have a vision for where this is going to go? Is this a commitment that you would like to make? Or is this something that you're thinking about we can expand on? It's, I know it's, it's new and exciting, but sometimes without leadership support, it doesn't doesn't continue. Is that anything you can hint towards what your feeling is on this? Sure. My vision is really to follow Mistel on this. Um, <laughs> I honestly wouldn't be spending a weekend at Hancock Shaker Village talking about farm to school if Mistel and also Ms. Buzanski didn't say, this could be really great, let's do it. And you know, the results they've gotten so far have been amazing. Yeah. Obviously, um, Ms. Stell is the expert in this area, and my job is just to empower her and, and see how far she can take it. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You could ask him about his first job at some point. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a story that's occurring, but. Was it agricultural related? It was. It was at Agway. Oh, Agway. Okay. Yeah. In Northampton? Or? No, no, it was Palmer. It was Palmer. part of the same shop, though. Okay. I got to drive the truck back and forth. Oh, that's Agway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any um, any other uh, questions? Thank you so much, and thank Quite you welcome. to Grow Food Northampton yeah. for, yeah. Your, yeah. for your collaboration. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, we were excited and thrilled about a ninety-seven thousand dollar <laughs> grant. Now we're going to hear about a six hundred and ninety-seven thousand dollar grant. Um, and this is uh, this is a report on the FY twenty Commonwealth Preschool Partnership Initiative grant. And I know uh, Josh and Barbara are here, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so talking about not thinking that we were ever going to get the grant. Um, in general. Um, Barbara was here a little over a year ago um, presenting the strategic plan that had been put together um, with community stakeholders and we had sort of three or four different versions of what we were hoping to um, accomplish should funding ever become available in the state and we were lucky enough to sort of plan for our gold star um, option last January and then we applied again this June after um, not receiving an award during the first round. And to our surprise, persistence has paid off um, and we were part of um, cohort two. And so the goals of our grant um, this year are really to form partnerships and alignment with three of our community partners. Um, so Sunnyside Child Care, People's Institute, as well as Community Action Head Start are our three partners. Um, and our hope is to really offer increased access for our youngest learners um, and also to reduce the transition that our students um, have to experience on a daily basis. So during our current setup, our students who receive special education services um, often spend half of their time in a community preschool and half of their time in our preschool, um, which is great because we love to see them and have them participate, but it's also not ideal. And so what the grant has allowed us to do is really expand the participation that they have in their community preschools by providing itinerant special education services. So our OT, PT, um, behavioral supports, as well as speech and language pathologists will be able to go to the community preschools instead um, and offer those services there. And then one of the other biggest pieces of the grant is um, professional development and transportation for our high needs um, students. And so transportation, if you can believe, is extremely expensive. Um, our retirement plan will be to open up a transportation company. Um, <laughs> but last year we spent- I won't be a driver. <laughs> <laughs> um, last year we spent close to $1,000 on preschool transportation alone, um, just because of the amount um, that each run takes and because we have the split day also. Um, and so the grant has given us at first, we thought it was 40,000, 
Come to find out upon review of our budget, it turned out to be 51,000 um, in transportation funds, um, which is great. And so we're very excited. Um, we'll be coming to you in a few weeks um, with some new job descriptions for some of the positions um, that the grant is allowing us to hire um, and also be posting shortly um, the staff positions at Bridge Street School. And I do have to share um, a little bit of a story. So today I was at an IEP meeting at Bridge Street School and I was on my way out the door and one of our um, custodial staff stopped me and congratulated us because he was so excited that we were going to have another preschool class. Um, and he said, I will do whatever you need me to do to help. Um, and on top of that, he was thrilled that they were going to be there um, a little bit after our school day. So part of the grant is also that we will have before and after school care um, for that particular classroom, which will be great for our families um, who are working as well. And so he said, I can't wait for them to be here until five o'clock, um, which was just so remarkable. Um, and he was just genuinely thrilled at the idea that we were going to have more students. And so that was very refreshing um, and just heartwarming to have at the end of the day. So I'm gonna just add a little bit because I can never help myself. Um, so as Josh said, we didn't really expect to get this because the priority, um, there were three priorities of districts, three tiers um, that were eligible to apply for the grant. Um, it, you had to have had one of the strategic planning grants, which we had. Um, and then um, districts that had, I don't know, I think it was more than 60% um, low income free and reduced with the highest priority mm -hmm. then between 42 and 59 was the next and between 25 and 41 and we're at about 40 percent so mm -hmm. you know so we were not in the priorities but um but obviously it, they thought it was okay and so that was pretty lucky for us and and i think i mean people work really hard on it and um and it um it's a two-year grant the first mm -hmm. year at 697 um, and change and the second year I think it's 625 and the state wants um, you know they want to know what local funds are going to go into it and mm -hmm. basically a lot of local funds are, are going into it to start with because all of um, you know each of the participating programs is or either have well, they have the cost of running the program. We're not creating additional classrooms. We're creating some additional slots, and as Josh said, creating alignment and continuity. And you know, and then our classroom that is going to be full day is is one that's a half day now, so that it's you know it, we already are putting as a community a lot into it. So I'm optimistic I don't know why but um, that after the two years that the state understands that the Department of Early Education and Care understands that that communities will still need support mm -hmm. um, the there were five years worth of what were called preschool expansion grants PEG grants in um, five communities in the state and those ended, there was a, it was a federal grant. Those ended on, um, on June 30th or August 31st, I'm not sure which, of this year. But the state is continuing to fund them, even though they said to all those cities, well, go find the money, because we're not, you're not gonna, you know, this grant ends. But then they, they got it that they can't just say, go find the money, because the money is not just floating free. So anyway, so I'm trying to be optimistic that um, that we'll continue to get some support, and also that um, the the professional development that's offered and all of this can spread to other um, to all of the community-based programs in in um, in Northampton, so that it would start with those three, but that hopefully. Um, folks from other programs will participate in the professional development and that we will have more alignment across the city. So, anyway. That's it, that's all I got. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for us? Yes, uh, any comments or questions from the school committee? Yes, Ms. I'm. I'm just so thrilled. This is one of the most exciting um, 
things that have come along. <coughs> and we know how important early education is onwards. So thank you for just trying and trying again and continuing to try even when people say no. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. We weren't going to give up. <laughs> we weren't. And actually, when we spoke with um, the liaison from the Department of Early Education and Care, we called her with a question. And, and you know, Josh and I both said, oh, we're so excited. We, you know. <laughs> her response was, well, persistence pays off. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say thank you and congratulations and it's fantastic news. Um, I so appreciated the presentation you gave earlier this year I think it was and um, to see it come through so quickly in some ways is um, I share your excitement and I just wonder and there may not be an answer to this but looking forward it sounds like it's for two years. Are there things that we as a school committee should be thinking about to support the growth, because the better this does, I think the better chances are that it will continue to be supported. Um, are th and maybe you don't have an answer tonight, but I just encourage you to let, help us think about things that we might um, want to talk about too to, to really support it. We don't have an answer yet, yeah. but yeah. I'm sure that during the budget discussions, it will absolutely <laughs> be something that we talk about. I think one of the most exciting parts of this is, is um, and I think lots of us have been saying this for years, that all of the kids in what, um, whatever program they're in in preschool, whether they're in, in the public schools or they're in, you know, they're at Meadowlark or Sunnyside or People's Institute or wherever mm -hmm. they are, they're all our kids. Mm -hmm. And so this is really acknowledging that in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's not just they're not our kids just when they get to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because only about 25% of our kindergartners have been in the public school preschool. So that means 75% of them have been somewhere else. <laughs> And um, you know, and they and they are our kids. So this is it's sort of exciting to have this opportunity. Thank Mr. You. Yeah, I, did, <clears throat> I just wanted to add real quick, as obviously for obvious reasons, this conversation and the result was a topic of conversation in my house. And everything that came up was Josh and Bobber, Josh and Bobber, Josh and Bobber. This is all you and all the work that you put into it. So um, I appreciate you giving thanks to other folks, but I think we and I can certainly thank you and greatly appreciative for the extra hours you put in, knowing that it was a long shot. It's uh, I've been there myself, and it's, it's really stupendous what you guys put into it. So thank you. Um, the other thing I want to mention real quick, regarding the other PEG grants, there's um, there was a pretty comprehensive uh, evaluation done by AIR, and I don't know if you've seen the results. I've only seen snippets of it, but it definitely shows beyond, beyond um, you know, additional slots for kids, more convenience for parents, et cetera. All the other aspects combined, um, the evidence is showing the enhanced quality of it has led to what we all want, which is kids entering kindergarten and first grade better prepared than they would have been otherwise, and certainly better compared to their comparison groups, that's what the study is beginning to show. So um, everything, everything everybody said and just the fact that we got this and it's a lot of money, it's affects a lot more money, twice as much as I thought it was, because <laughs> I didn't know there was a year or two, um, is just, yeah, I reiterate what everybody else said. Congratulations and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much again and congratulations and yeah. looking forward to hearing okay. about it. Continuing with our grants theme, um, we have uh, uh, Ms. McLaughlin is here to give us a report on a capital uh, skills capital grant, um, one hundred thirty-three thousand eight hundred seventy-nine thousand. Yeah, I, uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm here to present about <coughs> an amazing opportunity that we were uh, afforded through the state of, um, awarding us that large sum of money to uh, continue from the skills capital funding. Um, it's not every day that we get to stand and shake hands with the lieutenant governor, but Dr. Provost and I were able to do just that when we were accepting the grant. And we were also able to hear a lot about how uh, the importance of assisting and closing the workforce gap. 
uh, we were able to hear from many members of the executive branch about this idea of really training students uh, at, at the high school, middle school, and all the way up in being prepared not only just for college, but for entering the workforce. And uh, we heard a lot about that there were areas of need specifically in IT, uh, where even in this area there's about 500 open jobs in the IT industry. And so um, we were given the opportunity through this capital funding to actually be able to train our students here in Northampton to go on to college, go on to careers, and really be uh, competitive in the marketplace. Uh, so more than that, though, we also were able to stand there among 45 other uh, awardees elected from the entire Commonwealth, which was really pretty exciting. Especially for us, we were a public school amongst a lot of colleges, at community colleges, and many vocational schools, um, and we were one of four that were newly awarded this award, so that was exciting too. And so what does this really mean? You, many of you know that we have an IT Pathways program in the high school, and so that's where our students get a lot of different opportunities to uh, train in IT, get early exposure to see if this is a career they're interested in. Uh, they get early college, a, a career, college and internship opportunities in this. Uh, right now, our program is, has just shy of 40 students, and it's really quite a blend of girls and boys, which is great. Um, we also have, uh, we've been able to have many different schools who have come actually to talk to us. They've been directed by uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to come and look at our program and see how it is that they can shape what they're doing similar to the way we are. So that's been really exciting. And we've also had our students asked to participate on statewide uh, panels, which has been great. Uh, been, been really exciting for them, but even more importantly, our first group just finished their first round of internships that were kind of out in the city in different businesses, and in that, one of them got off a <coughs> job during the summer, sorry, during after the summer experience, so he's working during the school year. And we also had one of our early, as we say, pilot people, our pilot Innovation Pathway students just accept a full-time position working for the school's IT department. And when she had started, she was like going in theater, and then totally changed the direction that she was going, so that's been really exciting as well. Um, in addition, we have uh, we had two students also that part of this idea, idea of the IT exploration is, is really exposing yourself early on before you go out and you know, invest in career or college experiences. And we had two students who went through the program almost all the way through and then decided, you know, even after their internship, hey, this has been really great, but this is a career option that we, you know, aren't as interested in anymore, which is also important. That's really what we want them to do at this early age before investing in, you know, a four-year or, you know, longer degree. So that was exciting, too, um, even though we lost two great members of our, of our team. But this particular grant, the uh, goal of this is to expand upon the innovation pathway and provide additional opportunities in setting up what's called a Cisco Academy at the high school. And so what that means is we really are striving to continue to expand the program of innovation pathway. And in the current option, this, uh, this class, our new academy, has currently enrolled 17 students, many of whom aren't IT pathway students. Some of them are um, older than when the pathways options were available for them. And some are early freshmen that maybe through this, this course may decide, oh, this is something we're interested in and taking um, the route of the innovation pathway after that. Um, we, by doing this program, we're able to train more students in, per, in professional opportunities that are sought after. The brand Cisco, many of you probably have heard, it's one of these very high-end companies that uh, does a lot with technology. And in doing so, uh, by having our students get exposed to this early, even with our own IT department, they were like, ooh, they get to work on Cisco equipment. They learn kind of like that top tier of what it, what it means in IT to work with servers, networks, and et cetera. And so it's a highly respected company. A lot of people in the professional industry get certifications, Cisco certifications. I'm even in a grad class that is a preparation for a Cisco uh, certification test. And this class, while we're looking at this initial class, it does uh, offer students that opportunity to get those that early exposure, but also certification. So that's pretty exciting too. Um, the other neat thing about it is, you know, if you look in the area, there's only about one traditional high school in the area that has a Cisco Academy and. So this in Western Mass, and there may be, there's a large number of like vocational schools, again, that have this, but really we're standing out amongst others of saying like, here we are and we are offering this credentialing. And some of the schools that have students that go through it have had their graduates go right on to work for like Children's Hospital, 
banks, pu Boston Public Library. I mean, these are the types of programs that really set you apart. And IT is one of those areas that you can go and get college uh, credentials in, but you can also often go in with a high school degree. So again, it's this idea of getting this preparation and getting that exposure early and then going out and making your way in the world um, in an industry that is certainly um, recognized as, as a need. Uh, there's, uh, even in our own region, it's considered a priority field um, based on the regional market uh, labor market blueprint. So that's really exciting for us. So needless to say, all of us are really excited for this. It provides students a rich experience before they even leave um, to depart to higher ed, ed or to different career experiences. And it allows us to continue to shine as a lighthouse community um, in, in educating students in a field that's really booming uh, in both not only the Commonwealth but really across the nation and even globally. So we're super excited about this opportunity and uh, thankful that the state is recognizing the importance of this and helping us move forward in that. Any, any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, it just after all three presentations, I feel like when the budget was approved this summer, it felt pretty grim. Like we were facing a loss in federal funding and a loss in net state aid. And I never expected to to be in the position where we've got all these, um, these grants awarded. Um, and I just, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate not just our, our district leaders, but also our community leaders for, um, for going out there and um, having the vision and the dedication and securing these grants because it's amazing that despite the lack of support from the state and federal governments in, in many ways that we're able to continue moving the district forward and providing all these amazing opportunities for our students and their families. So thank you so much. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Ms. You. McMuffin. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. So now we have a um, a donation. Uh, this is from the Jack, uh, Jackson Street School PTO. Uh, Fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Did you want to? Give us any information about this? The only thing that I wanted to let you know, this is from the Street PTO. Um, they are give, um, having a donation of $15,000 for the year. They do usually three different checks during the course of the year, so if we could approve it once for the year when the other two checks come in, that way I wouldn't need to bring them back to the committee. And it's uh, for the general gift in classroom supplies and hardware materials for the classrooms. That they're going to be used for. Okay. So... Um Someone make a motion on this. Uh, quick? Move yeah. to accept the gift from Jackson Street PTO in the amount of fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Any discussion on it? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. So thank you to uh, Jackson Street PTO. Um, next, we have a couple of um, items. Uh, First one is a report. This is from Dr. Cheevers on the middle school math pilot. Just do the front. That's what I do. It's the light switch. I turn it on and off. One no. shot. <laughs> you just took it from me. That's what I was saying. You think you need to ask you to just get it. Good evening. Yes. It is always my pleasure to share about our professional development activities in the schools. And we have lots going on, but tonight we're going to specifically talk about mathematics. We're going to begin um, by, uh, first I want to introduce my team that's here tonight. Um, I want to introduce, this is Rachel Stabley-Hale, who is the department chair at Northampton High School Math. And this is Jim Hansen, who is our mathematics coach, grades three through eight. I also want to recognize Beth, Beth Adams, who is a teacher uh, at the high school. And all of these people are members of the vertical math team, as well as Leslie Wilson, principal of JFK Middle School. We're all members of the vertical math team. We've been meeting for several years now. 
uh, to develop professional development plans. Uh, so I'm going to begin um, by talking about the professional development for summer of 2019. Um, and I want to begin with another grant story. All of the stipends for this professional development were paid for uh, from a competitive grant that we applied for. So that was, that was really helpful. It made it possible. It's very expensive to pay for teachers, but so worthwhile to pay for teachers to come to summer professional development. These teachers gave up three full days of their summer to come to this professional development. So that shows real dedication. Uh, the participants at this professional development, uh, we had, uh, let's see, all but two math teachers from JFK Middle School. So we had a lot of people from JFK, grades six through eight, and we had many, many special educators. We had even a fifth grade teacher who was interested in working on the transition between fifth grade and, and and sixth grade, who is uh, Travis Yagazinski, and he's also a member of the vertical math team. And then we had every single ninth grade math teacher from the high school join us for this professional development. So the topic was five practices for orchestrating productive mathematics discussions. And the purpose was to assist teachers in using students' responses to advance mathematical understanding to move understanding forward and to make instructional decisions. And then the, the five math practices are, one, anticipating likely student responses to challenging mathematical tasks and questions from students, monitoring students' responses to the tasks while students work in pairs and groups, selecting particular students to present mathematical work, sequencing the student responses that will be displayed in a specific order, and then connecting different students' responses and connecting the responses to key mathematical ideas. Clearly, this professional development was deep and needed a highly trained professional to conduct it. Um, I'm, gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Rachel and Jim to talk a little bit about their experiences in these, uh, in these two separate professional development experiences. We had two providers. We had Sandy Madden from the University of Massachusetts Mathematics Department, and we had um, Mike Flynn from Mount Holyoke. He's the chair of the, of the math education program. And so those were our providers. And Jim and Rachel are going to talk a little bit about their experiences with this professional development. So, Rachel. Hi, good evening. Um, so I want to say that it, I'm in my 13th year here in the Northampton Public Schools, and this was by far the most rich and productive professional development experience that I've had here. Um, to be able to work closely with my colleagues for three consecutive days um, on practices that we know will have a direct impact on students' experiences in our classroom was an extraordinarily rewarding experience. Um, we very rarely have um, such an extended period of time to work together, um, and this framework, the five practices um, was directly applicable to the work that we're doing. So our curricular approach at the high school involves having students work collaboratively. Um, and managing rich discourse around mathematics in a heterogeneous classroom is really difficult work. And um, for those of us who started teaching with a more um, direct instruction approach, um, who maybe have less experience managing student discourse in a math class, um, this was a really invaluable experience. Um, we have varying levels of comfort working in a, um, a classroom like that within my department. And so to get us all to the table, to be able to not just share in the expertise of San Sandra Madden, but also each other's expertise was truly invaluable. Um, so Sandy has um, a lot of experience with um, supporting classrooms um, engaged in this kind of discourse. She works with um, teacher candidates at UMass in the STEP program, um, and she also has deep knowledge of the curriculum, the Core Plus Mathematics program that we're using at the high school. So um, to be able to work with someone who knew a lot about our curriculum and also a lot about the practices that best support our curriculum um, was 
really a dream come true. Um, and I can say that everyone in the department um, left that experience feeling really energized about starting the year. Um, there's this kind of buzz Beth was talking about, you know, at lunch people are sharing ideas and talking about their experiences um, and saying, oh, I tried this thing and this is how it worked and hey, I've got this great idea, let me share it with you. Um, and it, I think there's this sense of sort of revitalization and, and just excitement um, in the department now as a consequence and we're all really looking forward to the, the follow-up work that will come with this um, because we know that this is a big project and it's something that we have been um, really desirous of, of doing this kind of work around. Um, so we're really grateful to have had this opportunity and excited to be continuing this work. Um, and especially exciting to be continuing this work um, in collaboration with the middle school because they're engaged in the same kind of work. Um, and so for us to, to be working together um, and creating a more unified approach to teaching and learning mathematics at the secondary level is literally a dream come true for me. So the whole time that I've been in the district, one of the things that I've most wanted is to have a more unified and coherent approach to how we teach mathematics in the Northampton Public Schools. And it's really exciting to feel like that's happening now. Um, so I'm just so grateful that we've had the opportunity to do this work and excited to continue it. So hi, everyone. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, Mike Flynn's work with the middle school, because um, the two groups were actually separated during the PD. Um, but there was very, you know, there's a lot of commonalities between what Rachel just told you about and what happened with the middle school. Um, as a little bit of a background, Mike Flynn uh, comes highly recommended and is somebody who uh, has had a personal influence on me. I uh, attended the mathematics leadership program at Mount Holyoke, which is um, a, a highly regarded, highly renowned um, mathematics professional development community. Um, many of you might be familiar with the Summer Math Institute that had been taking place at Mount Holyoke way back into the 80s, um, where countless numbers of teachers um, from elementary on up through high school were trained and specially trained in professional development and mathematics. Um, <clears throat> I guess back in the day, they used to actually uh, spend all that time in the dorms together talking about mathematics. And a lot of these teachers were folks who weren't necessarily um, there coming from a, a place of a lot of knowledge of mathematics. Well, uh, Mike Flynn has taken that uh, Summer Math Institute and some of the energy around that and taken it into the 21st century um, with a, a master's program. Um, it, it's been, you know, <clears throat> certainly transformational for me. Um, it's what brings me here today as, as the math coach for Northampton. Um, so, in the course of this particular professional development, he worked with the middle school teachers to help them finally craft lessons that would um, bring up student voice. And um, <coughs> that's uh, research backed as a, a, just a very important way of getting mathematical ideas um, out to a community of students. Um, and, it's, and it's a challenging idea. Um, it's, it's very different from the way most of us in this room learn mathematics. Um, but uh, these five practices are um, research-backed as well. Um, they come originally from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, the authors of the book, Mary Kay Stein and um, Peg Smith, are nationally regarded through the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Um, their original uh, first edition of this book came out back in the 90s. Um, and I've been to a, a few workshops at NCTM that um, where, the, where they've talked about these five practices. But it was really um, through uh, Mike's finally crafting of the three days that brought this to life for our middle school teachers. And I will, um, you know, kind of kind of say the same thing that Rachel just said about what I've heard is reflections from these teachers. Um, after the first day, I, I remember meeting one of the teachers who, you know, I'm just getting to know some of these folks, but. Um, uh, in the parking lot who was just el elated and here it was you know mid-august again giving up some summer but elated at after one day uh, working with uh, Mike Flynn and uh, just just getting all sorts of jazzed up for the year um, I've also had the privilege in the first few weeks of school of, of starting to see this in action um, starting to see uh, students uh, maybe even some who I saw uh, I was in a sixth grade class the other day and I, I saw some who in fifth grade maybe were a, a little reluctant or shy to share some of their math ideas coming up to the uh, document projector, sharing some, some really um, pretty outstanding and phenomenal sorts of math ideas to their 
to their classmates. So um, it's, uh, it's already working its way into action. Um, and uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about how um, it, it's really uh, getting us off to a really nice start um, here, uh, you know, it, as far as uh, getting the role of student voice into uh, mathematics class. And just for your reference, this is what the book looks like in the five practices for orchestrating mathemat productive mathematics discussion. Um, and I also just want to say another word about, uh, about Sandy Madden and, uh, and Mike Flynn. We required a professional development provider for the high school that did know both the components of the program that we used as well as the five math practices and finding a provider who was high quality and able to deliver both of those pieces was not an easy thing. We could have flown people in from Arizona, ASCD. We could have flown people in from Nashville and other places in the country, but we chose to go local because these people gave us a, an excellent high quality experience. I would also mention that when we go with somebody local, we all, most of the time we get more than what is looked at as an hourly rate. Sandy Madden met with us at least three times, at least, for well over a half a day. She actually took an entire day and spent that day at the high school to gain some insight before she met with me yet again to craft the experience at the high school. And then she's meeting with Jim again to help craft an experience that the teachers are going to be having on the 18th. Those are not billable hours. Those are hours that she is giving above and beyond, or you can consider it part of the package that we're getting. Mike Flynn has also met with me on numerous occasions um, and is also meeting with Jim again to carefully craft these experiences for teachers. When at all possible, we always try to use local people because we get that experience of crafting face-to-face -face and we always get um, a really good, you know, I guess, bargain um, because we're able to spend more time. So I just wanted to, to mention the extra time and recognize Mike and Sandy for their, their extra time for this work. Uh, yes, let's see. Um, so the, um, so the, the plans moving forward are such that um, Mike and Sandy are going to continue their work with the faculty. And they're going to function in a couple of different capacities. Number one, they're going to provide a little more, I would call it direct professional development on the 18th. That's actually going to be Sandy. And we're going to bring all of the teachers together, 6 through 12, with special ed teachers. Everybody, all the math teachers are together. And we have a very special, specially craft event, crafted event for them on that day. And I think that is truly one of the most important things, to bring the middle school and the high school together. We're working very hard at aligning and crafting experiences for our students and for our curriculum that are aligned and in both strategy and with the, uh, and with the standards. So this is going to be a very important day. Um, and then, this is probably one of the best parts. Sandy and Mike are going to spend some time in classrooms with teachers one-on-one. -on -one. And they will be both at the middle school and the high school working with teachers. And then another bonus is such that they're, Rachel and Jim and actually Tim Levy, the department chair of math at the middle school, will also be able to spend shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time with them doing leading peer observations and walkthroughs so that they can also continue their professional learning. And again, this is something that is um, unique to the experiences of these particular professional development providers. This is something that we're planning and there's a lot of conversation around that that we likely wouldn't get if we were flying somebody in from very far away. So grateful for those experiences. Um, all right, so that is the professional development 
section of this presentation. Um, I had a few other things that I wanted to mention about professional development that I thought by virtue of the comments that were shared earlier that you might find useful. Um, firstly, um, I want you to know that in the Northampton Public Schools for the past several years, we have been working on growing our own professional development providers. This has been a goal of mine, it's a goal of the school, it's a goal of our, our professional development plan to grow our own professional development providers. Th these are some of the ways that that is happening. Number one, we have two foundations, our phonics-based program, we have two um, professionally tra uh, trained providers in our district now. They provide all of the professional de uh, development for grades K through th three with our Foundations Our Phonics program. And now that we're up and running with this professional training, we are actually getting people from other districts that are coming to our training and are paying, contributing um, to the training so that you know we're actually making a little money on it. Not a lot, but just a little bit. And I'm very proud to tell you that our teachers are, are delighted to do this work. They want to be leaders. So we are growing leaders with foundation. LLI, level literacy intervention. We have our own trainers now. We worked on this a couple of years ago. So our, all of our LLI, level literacy intervention training, is done in-house. We do not send people out anymore. Um, and we also do all <coughs> math recovery training. We have a math recovery champion in our district. She it works primarily in the elementary schools. And here's the good news. We have another grant. We have a math recovery grant. And part of that grant is to provide teachers with what we call AVMR2, which is another, which, which is an additional math recovery experience. And recently, I was able to negotiate having our middle school interventionist pilot the very first program with uh, math recovery in our middle school. Very exciting times. I wiggled her, I guess, into a grant, and she is got going to be uh, taking, uh, getting her training for actually for free. And this is happening in Holyoke. Um, I'd also like to mention the training and mention our curriculum teacher leaders. Our curriculum teacher leaders are highly tra trained curriculum developers. I've trained them myself, and they've trained each other, and we're writing curriculum. That's something that we have been working at for quite some time. We do not hire out. We don't have anybody come in. We provide that and save up all kinds of money. Our coaches, Jim and Andrew Samuelson, who's not here tonight, our literacy coaches, um, we are, they are providing a, a lot of professional development around our literacy and math programs. Um, let's see, and I also want to talk about the newest thing that I'm trying this year. Um, this, I, I'm calling it Homegrown PD. And uh, so over the years, we've provided and or I have conducted and CTOs have conducted a lot of understanding by design curriculum writing. Part of that is our common summative assessments and rubrics. So what I did this year is I created a folder of materials for each of the departments. So they have slides that are operational, They're the slides that are instructional, um, that help guide them in this process of looking at their summative assessments in each of the units. And they also have um, some uh, samples, materials showing samples of common summative assessments and some instructions about how to write rubrics and how to write uh, authentic performance-based assessments. Our teachers on a, are on a real continuum. Some are experts in this and others are real beginners. But this is the kit that I've created and on Wednesday, our department chairs and CTLs will be leading these workshops in this homegrown professional development experience. Rather than having somebody come in, rather than hiring out, rather than sending out, we're saving money, but even more so, we're helping our leaders grow um, by giving them the experience of leading this professional development, which I feel very confident that they're able to do after having had the experiences they have had with professional development over the years. 
So I just, I wanted to point out all of these ways in which we are very careful about not only the money that we're spending, but how we're spending it and the quality of professional development that we insist upon in this district um, and the quality that our own leaders offer us as well. Um, a few, well, I think that's probably enough detail about that. But if you have any questions about any of that, I would be happy to, uh, to answer them. Before moving on to the pilot program, which is really exciting. Yes. I just have a quick question. Um, it was, I'm so glad you included all the evaluations. It was great to see. We were so excited about it. Uh, but when you're talking about doing this sort of alignment and there's turnover, so you have new people entering the district that may not have been part of that experience, what's our plan moving forward? So that's why we have the, the leaders, the district leaders that we do. When we have, let's say, a third grade teacher leaves, now you know that person was trained, what do we do? Well, we have a trainer inside of our district. So that person, that new teacher, is trained using our in-house trainer. Um, so that's how, that's how we're moving professional development along and staying consistent. That's the most important thing, is keeping up with that level, the high quality level of professional development. It's hugely important. How are you going to do that? You can't maintain that by sending people out of the district all the time. Um, you, you have to, you have, to um, have a system, you have to have a plan, you have to be thoughtful about, about how you're going to supply that for yourself. Ms. Voss. Thank you, and it's really great to hear just how much the teachers were able to get out of this. I think last December we were talking about math, and something I heard some of the teachers say in this room was, we just need time to work together and talk to each other, and it's just really great to hear that's happening. So, um, and, and I'm glad to read, as Ms. Fallon said, that everybody found it so helpful. I do just have a question. Um, so if a teacher comes in at any grade, I guess I'm thinking middle and high school since that was the topic of this. Um, certainly there's a curriculum and there's topics they're supposed to cover um, and it fits within the state standards but is it, can you just help me understand, it sounds like we also have this idea that, or, or I shouldn't say that, I'm wondering if we tell the teachers okay you have to say do, I'll make up numbers, 50% of it you have to teach them to work collaboratively, 50% we're going to lecture, like how much do, does an individual teacher get to come in and say, this is how I'm comfortable teaching, I'm good at you know, doing it this way, versus how much of the professional development is more about how you should structure the learning environment? Does that question make sense? I'm just curious what the balance is and what, how much autonomy a given teacher has in their classroom versus you know, the person who's been through different trainings is going to tell them, no, you have to do it this way. So there are many, many answers to that. So I will be very brief, and um, but I could answer that question all night. Um, so first of all, it depends on the subject area. Um, for example, when talking about the five practices, we are asking teachers to take up an instructional sequence. We are asking teachers to adopt those strategies. So, but it's not that we're telling them exactly what lessons to teach and in what order, you know, that's, what te that's the judgment that teachers have in their mathematics class. And of course, we're never, we're te we have a curriculum, it is our guide, but we have students in front of us and we teach and we get feedback and then we respond to that t feedback by changing the instructional activity, whatever it might be, and then we continue on with that sequence. We assess, we learn what we need to do, we change the instructional sequence. That is the pattern of, I, I guess I would call it modern, modern instruction. Um, and then when we give the summative assessment at the end, then that is something that a group of teachers could talk about and analyze and make decisions about curriculum. All of our decisions, I would say 90% of our decisions about curriculum, by the way, are really made by teachers. Um, and I would consider that Northampton teachers have a tremendous amount of autonomy. Um, we, uh, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Well, I just, yeah. Pardon, sorry. I just feel like I, I ought to add a little bit. It just in that, I, you know, I think 
myself and uh, my colleague Andrew, Andrew Samuelson as coaches, that's, that's part of what we do. You know, I, what particularly resonated in your question was this idea of, you know, how much ought to be lecture and how much ought to be, you know, sort of student independent work or, or whatever blend we have. That's where the instructional coach comes in. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I kind of sort of tell it like it is and like I do my job, I guess. And, and I, I like to do that through collaboration and try to work with the teacher from wherever they are. Um, and, you know, to, as the best I can, I, I try and really convince them that, hey, uh, you know, if you stand and talk to them for 60 minutes, it, it's, it's not going to work. <laughs> and and most, most of our teachers are, are very progressive and, and, and really willing to give these things a try and, and also are very into this collaboration idea, you know. Um, so anyway, just a, a little bit on that. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. I really appreciate the presentation. And just as a teacher, I know you can't fake enthusiasm for PD. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> <you're> true. <laughs> yes. And I felt that you really felt it. And, uh, and so I really appreciate that. And the role of coaches is so important in this. Um, and also, just anecdotally, I have a sixth and a seventh grader, and they're both. And I think it, you know, it's from. I think it's from PD. I mean, they're talking mathematically more and. And I mean, you might know my kids, but that's not a common <laughs> thing to talk about. <laughs> but I really noticed it, and like this kind of real desire to talk about area. And um, I thought, wow, you know, um, things are really shifting a little bit. So I love that you love the PD and that you're here and you don't have to be here to talk about it. Yeah. And again, I know you weren't big in the enthusiasm. So. <laughs> thank you for saying that, and thank you for recognizing um, coaches and. and and Berkeley team members. I can't tell you how privileged I am to work with these these teachers and they're not, you know, we the vertical math team is huge. Um, it's, it's just such a pleasure to work with people who are so dedicated and so uh, enthusiastic uh, to the work. Um, none of the decisions that I make about curriculum, about uh, professional development are made in my office alone with the door shut. Um, every single decision that I made, that I, I should say that we make, is a collaborative effort. So I think that's important. That's Mr. Moore. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is a question, it's just a, while we got you all here. Um, how is the vertical alignment continuing with the elementary schools in terms of, you know, our kids arriving, uh, arriving kind of where you expected them to be and that kind of thing? I would say more and more so, our math recovery <coughs> program and our math investigations together are working very, very well. Um, and well, we'll share a little bit more about the alignment piece in just a moment when we talk about the, the pilot. And I think you'll, you'll, have, you'll be pleased with right. some of the things that we're going to be doing and have, yeah, have planned. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, so I think it was a year ago that we were collectively talking about the uh, math uh, study RFP, <clears throat> which, which um, lasted maybe two months. Um, it was a tense time, and, and I think that, I, personally speaking, I learned a lot. I was really surprised by, by the number of educators that came and talked about how they felt disrespected and stuff. Um, I, I met with you about that. I met with Rachel. I met with another teacher. I met with Mr. Lombardi. I met with a couple of students. I met with a couple of parents. I just wanted to more deeply understand what was happening. And I remember talking about what I learned was that no one really wanted to drop integrated math. Nobody wanted to drop the momentum we had. But what I did greatly appreciate was that everybody acknowledged that we can do better and the teachers really wanted to do better. And they didn't like the RFP study approach. That was fine. They wanted more PD. And it just sounds like you guys hit a home run. So I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate the outcome of here. It feels great to know that you heard your teachers. I don't, you always do that, Nancy, so I don't, I'm just acknowledging that you heard from your staff, you heard what they needed, and you accommodated what they wanted. Um, I almost feel a bit like we didn't do this last year and the year before and the year before, because it's a frustrating thing to continue to teach in a really, really um, challenging new curriculum with a lot of pressure from the outside, with a lot of negativity <coughs> in the press and not get the kind of support they need, so much thanks for that. Um, with regard to, I mean, clearly I, I, I appreciate you talking about the, the added value that the two professional development providers offered. Um, 
from my perspective and the, from the information that I received, I didn't receive anywhere near that level of understanding as to what they were doing above and beyond the six hours they were contracted for. So the scope of work we received was virtually a sentence. And I think that hurts the process. If I had known what you explained, I would have had a much deeper and much more, a better understanding. I still would have appreciated probably a more transparent process to see if any other local people could provide the same thing. I still think I have a fiduciary responsibility for that. But I feel much better about the idea that we want, we're not just spending money wildly because of all this other added work that they did and continued work. And I just didn't appreciate that because, frankly, that's not the information we received. So that's not your issue. But maybe I need to talk to you about these things ahead of time before um, I come up with, a, with a, a sense that there's something wrong. I can further further um, investigate. And I also, we did look at other, other providers, and mm -hmm. there, were, there were no other providers that were as highly qualified and would give us the outcomes that we were looking for, mm -hmm. and who had the knowledge base in order to do so. Well, the outcomes that you were looking for was key to me, absolutely key, and that's an that's a ongoing frustration that I have when we seek people is that I don't know what the outcomes are. and. Um, I think we need to do better there. So if you knew what the outcomes were, then um, we have to figure out a way so that we know what we're paying for and that we can support you with it. Um, and that's just not clear to me most of the time that we do contracts that we're clear on what our expectations are and what we want. And yet I'm hearing you've already thought about that. So it's just a communication thing. Somehow we, I, I feel like we need to find out more about what we're paying for and what the anticipated expectations are. And um, sometimes I can request it and I don't get it. Other times it's probably me not working as hard on it. So somehow maybe you and I can talk offline and figure out a better way. I, I don't recall getting a request, but I would be, I'm always happy to talk about professional development. I, I know. Thank you. My favorite topic. I know. <laughs> um, okay, so I would like to move on to the more exciting part of the program, or I don't know, maybe it's as exciting. Um, I want to talk about our math program selection process and what this is all about. Nancy, do you want the light? Oh, uh, can everybody read that? Can NCT, can you all read it? Yeah? Okay. Great. So first of all, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about the selection team. Um, and I would like to, uh, yeah, our selection team and the need, the program criteria, et cetera, um, all of these, and the final three, the selection, the pilot plan. So first of all, the need. So why, why, what is the need for an updated math program six through eight? Well, teachers were spending a lot of time and energy revising um, our, and reworking big ideas to make it work for students. Um, while it's easy to add practice worksheets and group problems and other quick fixes, it's not easy to do so with a conceptual framework consistency. This is the, the task of people who devote their lives to this. Uh, long, long hours over several, several um, years, even decades. Teachers did not have time and do not have time to continue this practice. And in this light, we found that ed reports confirmed the lack of cohesion and conceptual math practices and big ideas to support knowledge, understanding, and skills. So there was that issue. Um, we also need a program that embraces the Massachusetts, Massachusetts framework and is theoretically aligned to the standards of mathematical practices. More importantly, we are in need of a program that supports the transitions between our fifth and sixth grade and eighth and ninth grade curricula with instructional consistency and standards alignment to support all learners. So those were the, the contributing factors. Um, so our selection team, initially the vertical math teams uh, discussed and explored the issues with the lack of alignment and cohesion between the transitional years years and using the um, identified criteria, criteria a smaller group is able to sift through about a dozen math programs to select three finalists at least for the first round of reviews and after the first three selections were made the entire math department 
at JFK, including special educators, were eager to serve on the team. And I'll also tell you, we had fifth grade teachers, we also had high school teachers. We had a very crowded room of math reviewers, but it was all good. Um, the steps to textbook adoption were reviewed, and we do have a textbook adoption process. Um, and I won't read through all of it, but there's a very specific process of events that needs to happen that begins with selection of the, act of the committee and determining alignment. We have very specific criteria for that. Um, so next, we met several times for at least an hour and a half. Some days were even half days. Our team came out during the summer after school was out to meet to review these materials. We have professional uh, development provide, or professional uh, providers from companies come in and share their programs, and we had a very, very clear criteria selection. I'm not gonna go into all the details right now. It's really late, but if somebody would like more details, I have a, a seven-page document that details all of these. But, First of all, we asked ourselves, is this consistent with our district values? What are they? Building communities of engaged students. Are all students engaged with this curricula? Enabling students, all students, not just some students, but all the students to reach their potential. Does it nurture kindness, empathy, and tolerance? Um, and the tolerance piece was very important to us. We actually had a member from Real come in and discuss this with us and, and, and review the program with us. We really wanted to be very thorough and very thoughtful with our selection. Um, was it consistent with our mathematics transfer goals, K through 12? I think you've all seen those. Mm -hmm. um, we celebrated those last year and they're on our website. Um, and then we looked at instructional design and content and standards alignment. We looked at assessments and assignments. We looked at equity and access. Who can access this program? How do you get at it? And we looked at the instructional uh, technology integration. Our final three choices were open up resources, Carnegie Learning, and CPM. Open up resources one, hands down, unanimous. The entire room was all about open up resources. Um, and open up resources uh, has a lot of features to it. Um, it is free. How about that? It's a free resource. It's a web. It's a it's a web uh, resource. But the professional development, of course, costs money. And that is the Open Up Resources Company. Um, I recently learned this week that Amherst is also looking at, and actually I think they are adopting, I meet with them next week, um, Open Up Resources as well. This is a wonderful opportunity. This is what we like to do, share professional development between districts and we all, it also provides us opportunities for observations in both and, and collegiality uh, between both of the districts. So that's a really great opportunity as well. And then my favorite part about this is that if we end up adopting this, and we'll talk about the pilot plan in just a minute, um, we will have three programs that are all developed by the National Science Foundation written by the members of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and will be aligned with theory, instructional strategies, and practices. That's my job. That's why you hire me. And that it is my privilege to do that work. So let's talk about the pilot plan. So the pilot plan for fall for the middle school, sixth grade teachers are going to use the Open Up resources as their exclusive resource. This is exciting. Our sixth grade teachers, some of them, how many, two? Three, Three teachers yeah. came with already having used this curriculum. Oh, there, 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 were two. there were two. Okay, two out of the three teachers. So they decided that they're going to use the sixth grade program to fidelity for this first year. Their exclusive resource. Um, they're gonna follow the scope and sequence working through each of the lessons as designed Seventh grade teachers are going to implement uh, the rational number uh, arithmetic unit from Open Up Resources during their number system unit in September. 
And these lessons will align with some of the standards in the number system domain which students perform below state. So now we're going to actually look at something that, ah, we're not doing so well in that area. Let's, let's take a look and see what we can do, what this program does differently. How does the instruction, um, it, how does the instruction differ and will it uh, help our students? Seventh grade teachers will also teach the scale drawings unit and open up resources prior to ratio and, and proportion. Uh, we'll observe whether the physical models of proportional reasoning from the scale drawing unit will result in improved reasoning during the ratio and proportional unit. And this is a critical understanding in, in uh, seventh grade mathematics. Yes? This includes, all, includes special ed teachers? Yes. Okay. Yes. All of, it, all of the training, thank you for asking that. All of the training and all of his plans and even the textbook selection, all special ed teachers and regular ed teachers. Yes. Eighth grade teachers are going to use the open up resources for their introductory unit, rigid transformations and congruence. Teachers will experience the lesson structure and you know they'll find out what that's like compared to what they've done in the past. And it'll give the teachers the opportunity to integrate the use of mathematical tools and technology, which is a key component of, of um, MCAS 2.0. And additional plans. Jim Hansen is going to support grades 6 through 8 with the implementation of the pilot in collaboration with Tim Levy, um, as well as, uh, you know, Mike Flynn is going to be around, and I'm sure that he will also contribute to conversations and thinking about this. And the vertical math team will continue to support the implementation of the plot, coming together once a month, talking about how this is all going, and particularly those transitional years between 5th and 6th and 8th and 9th. And then the selection team plans to reconvene um, in November to review the implementation results and determine next steps. And from there, we'll see where we land. It could be we need to review something else and we're not happy with this. Or we could decide to, you know, to purchase and move forward with it. So um, that's that's the plan. Very exciting. Um, teachers were are very enthusiastic about this curriculum, and na the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics they actually wrote this curriculum. Teachers that belong to that organization. I love this program because it's not a Pearson product. It's, <laughs> just going to say it. It's not a Pearson product. You'll get a memo product. in the morning. It's not McGraw Hill, right? And it's super high quality. The professional development is the piece that you purchase. And we've already been, Jim and I have actually already been to a couple of professional developments from a variety of providers. And we already know that open up resource professional development is very, very high quality. So there it is, the exciting pilot plan that will help us align our district math practices, strategies, and instructional practices. Do you have any questions? Questions? Yes, Ms. Voss. Thank you. Um, I, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm just trying to digest. Um, I'll just start with, um, so can I just get a little bit of a 30,000 foot view of what happened? So we had some changes in math, and it sounds like there's a big change that just happened. So we're switching from one curriculum to another. Is that? And I'm just curious it's how a pilot program uh, how that came about and when it started and um, why we decided we needed the change. So, um, and, and you know, I think we've been talking about we or you know the community has been talking about let's do this improvement in math. And so a decision was made to go to a different curriculum. And I'm not questioning the decision at all. I just am curious about how it got there and, and what got us what the time frame was. Well, just to be clear, yeah. we have been talking about this for quite some time about what, how to make it our curriculum align. Um, I've noticed for a while that we had this alignment issues, and I watched the teachers work so hard in the middle school to try to, you know, align this curriculum. And they were putting a lot of time, a lot of effort into it, and as I said before, you know, adding practice worksheets and, and, and some collaborative experiences and things of that nature, those are fairly easy things to do. But it's very, very difficult to, and, and highly specialized, 
to realign a whole curriculum to make it work with middle school or to make it work with our uh, con our constructivist uh, elementary program and then with our integrated high school program. Not an easy thing to do. Um, and uh, so that was one of the one of the conversations we have had, you know, f for some time. Um, and the Ed Reports review of big ideas confirmed our concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I do want to acknowledge the good work that the math teachers were doing at the at the middle school. They were bending over backwards and still are to you know to utilize this um, this resource. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that would be. Yeah. So there weren't um, there wasn't any sort of formal assessment that said we have to change curriculum. It was just the teachers coming together and saying this isn't working. We need to try something sure. new. Is that? Mm -hmm. I just I just want to introduce a, a suggestion about terminology that might be helpful in the, in the conversation going forward. The math curriculum isn't changing. The resources that we're using to implement the curriculum are changing because the resources that we have were not optimal for the teachers. Do that. Yeah, I, and I'm just trying to get to the point. I also I, I agree with you about the Pearson comment. So um, that's. Um, can you give us just a sense of change? And, and thank you. The resources. I, you're right. Math is math, and um, yet there's certainly different ways to get kids talking about it, which is what we heard about about the professional development, right? But when this professional development is tied to this. Um, open up resources and we pay for that professional development to come in. Can you give us a sense of what that means? Do they come multiple times a year? Do they? Do we get in-house eventually that knows how to do this? What are the costs associated with it if we're not paying for the resources to teach the math? Um, what are we looking at with that? Well, those are, are some of those questions are unanswered because first we're looking for a high quality, the best piece that can you know align our curriculum. So some of those questions I can't answer very specifically, but the hope is and and the goal is always for uh, for the district to have its own professional in you know development providers within the district always. And I am, uh, I am certain that we can do that, not right away, obviously. But that is something that, that we will definitely be striving for. I also want to mention something that's very serendipitous about our professional development for the five math practices, which actually was planned prior to us understanding that one of the, the most important professional development pieces for open up resources, guess what it is? The five ma uh, pra the uh, five practices uh, orchestrating five math practices for uh, mathematical conversations. So that was a rather serendipitous thing, and we were very glad to know it, and that made us even um, you know <coughs> value the program even more. Um, so the professional development was they ha there are a variety of options. There are you can bring somebody in. Um, you can do video conferencing. You, uh, I don't think they have a send out program. I think it's either video conferencing or, or having workshops within, within your district. Um, we already worked with one of the providers at, with, a, a, um, uh, with, with the presentation about the curriculum. And I, we were really, really delighted with the high quality presentation and the, the math answers he gave were just absolutely spot on. Nancy? Absolutely. Um, the the fellow from Open Up Resources who did the video conferencing um, presentation with us is an educator, um, and it was the first time that I've had a presentation from a textbook publisher that it was not like a business person talking about the textbooks. It was a math educator, and so what he was able to do in describing the materials was talk to us as an educator um, and with deep knowledge of the content and, and w how the content is, is laid out in the resources. Um, so that, I think, was really appealing to all of us. Okay. And that was in contrast to the other two presenters we had, Carnegie and CPM Math, 
These were textbook people that came in that were hired to do a textbook presentation, but the person from Open Up Resources, he was a math educator. So. Yes, Ms. Brown. Um, I imagine also, I mean, just to, like, I feel like, um, Dr. Voss, that what you're, you're, you're getting at, and I mean, you work at a university, so I'm sure, sure that this is happening, but my experience in Northampton is that we were always looking for best practice, and over a period of time, that changes because human beings are changing, and that through the data that I feel like everybody is collecting and that um, Dr. Provost is pouring over and looking at, that that is all propelling us to revisit what we're doing, and that this is so appropriate that at times that we are um, circling through and thinking, is this as good as it can be? I mean, I, I think it's so exciting that we are part of a community that is so engaged and drawing from so many different resources. And, you know, I am going to say that we have a superintendent who is holding us and asking this of us, and that we have teachers that are stepping forward, and a curriculum director who's, you know, <laughs> facilitating this so that we can have deep inquiry. Um, and the choices are made at different times for different reasons. And I mean, I, I came in when we had investigations in Jackson Street, and that took a long time for people to feel comfortable with. That wasn't an easy um, fit for a lot of people. And now I just think, like, who would ever, you know, you can't imagine. But, but investigations, too, comes out. And suddenly, that's helping us to reform what our priorities are in our teaching. So I just think it's really great practice. Well, and that also brings up uh, something that Jim and I were talking about, big ideas. Not big ideas fault, but big ideas was one of the very first common core aligned curricula. And it might have been fine for a certain amount of time, but the open up resources is, it, it, it's state of the art curriculum, quite frankly, or state of the art uh, material as opposed to big ideas. Um, because it's been, or it's, it's, they've benefited from um, the work that was not as successful. Yes. I'm sorry, I have one other thing too, which I, um, there are many people who are in this room who have worked in this district for many years. And um, I also want to sort of say, Dr. Voss, that I think the other piece to this is that, um, the superintendent has now been with us for a steady amount of time. And I cannot, I feel like I am always saying this, but people who have worked in this district will remember that we went through many, many superintendents. And we didn't have the consistency of leadership. And we didn't have a curriculum director for a bunch of years that could give us this consistent um, direction and uh, focus to let us dig into this stuff in a way that we haven't been able to. I mean, the number of interim superintendents and like that was a big chunk of time. I'm just, I'm just thinking about your question, which is such a great question, like why now, what's going on? And that there are all of these pieces that I, I feel like we really do kind of forget how stability can help us to really examine things. Sorry, yeah. So, so I just want to clarify. I mean, I'm just interested in what you learned from the other and how the decision got here. And I'm glad you're moving us forward. I think change is a great thing and trying new things. So if that was yeah. not no, 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 I was expressed, just... um, that is definitely what, where I was headed. And I was just trying to understand how we landed here relatively quickly. You know, it, it feels like, and, and that's probably a really good thing. I, I mean, I'm just... Yeah. Um, a couple, just two other questions, just so we understand it. it. Are there textbooks, or is this all through the Chromebook? Is one question, and the other question is, um, how much? It, it kind of goes back to Dr. Provost's comment. It, we're not changing the curriculum; we're changing the materials the students are using to learn it. So, I mean, how much professional development do we need to pay for from Open Up Resources? I'm sure they'll have something to offer versus what we already know about it. I'm just trying to understand the resources that are going to be required to invest in it to make it as good as it can be without spending money that we don't need to spend, right? So two separate questions. We're, all, we're always very careful yeah. about that. So we will invest in the professional development and in as much as we are able to. There is some sequencing 
uh, an organization of, of, the, uh, of the math uh, units that our teachers get need to understand, not only just following what the unit provides, but also a deeper knowledge of why you know, the units are, are set up in this particular manner, and then how to make some instructional moves within each of those units as a teacher who, as all the teachers, will be differ differentiating um, the units at, you know, because they have students in front of them and not everybody learns the same. Um, and in the same uh, in the same pace, so we need to give enough professional development, provide enough professional development to the teachers so that they're able to do that. Um, and uh, now it's late, and I've forgotten your other question. Textbook versus Chromebook. Thank you. Good question. So this this uh, uh, curriculum is available, or resource is available both as an online resource and in hard copy books. And there are, there are activities and, and uh, tools that can be used on a Chromebook or you know, through Chromebook online, or there are all of the activities or most of the activities can be done at a desk with the real manipulatives in front of students. And in that respect, um, I think that's a really nice um, alignment with our elementary program as well. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities, but we do not have to, uh, students do not have to be in front of a computer in order to access the, the program. So they're giving us the textbooks for free? Is that true? No. no. If you buy the text, if you if you want to have the textbooks, you well, you have two things to do. You can either buy a book, a hard copy workbook, or you can print what you need um, from the online resource. So the printing is free. The printing is free, but if you want, if you want, you know, books or whatever, but everything is available for free on the internet. Really? You just okay. have to print it. So what is our plan for our students learning math? Are they going to get something in print, or are they just going to be expected to use a Chromebook? Undeterrent, well, I would assume that we, the teachers would use the online, um, the online resource and print some resources. But undetermined yet, we're not there yet, so I can't answer that question. And pilot, also, I'm sorry? But for the pilot, you're just doing the printing. Yeah, yeah for the pilot, we're doing, yeah. And we actually, we did buy some sample texts so that teachers could actually look at the whole um, yeah, we bought them for 6th, mm 7th, -hmm. and 8th, or just 6th, was no, it? No, we did it for, for all, S six. all three, just, yep. you know, one copy of the student. Yeah, so they one. could have, yeah, so yeah. they could see the whole thing. Okay. But, you know, the, the answer to that, I can't, I can't tell you yet because we haven't determined that. Good night, Eleanor. I just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't blame you for leaving. Before you go, I, can, uh, you had your Chromebook out. You oh, have, I did. You have your NPS issued Chromebook, mm -hmm. right? How's yeah. that going so far? It's going pretty well. I think we've had a few issues just with like Wi-Fi. There are so many people using, yeah. you know, the Chromebooks now and just computers that it's kind of it's been a bit difficult. I think. Um, and then. We're gonna dial it up to eleven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then um, also I think just recently I'm taking an ASL class at the high school and um, we're trying to do a research project and it seems like there's some sort of glitch or something and um, almost all of the websites that we need to access are blocked um, on the Chromebooks. So I think there are a few issues but... I can speak to that. Um, <laughs> I think it was around Tuesday of this past week. It might have been a little bit earlier than that. For some reason, our filtering software became insanely um, protective of us. And so I can tell you that the school employees can't get to the websites they need to get to right now either. So we're working on figuring out how to have it take a breath and open up the websites again. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think they're just like a few little kinks that still need to be worked out, but overall, it's, I think it's a good... It's a good program, and yeah. I just saw you working on it, and I asked you, is that really your Chromebook? It's actually not on the agenda, David. No, no, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if it was your Chromebook. Come on. Okay. Right. Own it down to one. Okay. <laughs> Thank good you, night. guys. Thank you, you for too. being here. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, any other questions about the pilot? No other questions. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
You gonna stay for the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> there is a personal message coming up in the item after this for any teachers who want to stick for like two minutes. Okay. Uh, personal message. Yes. Um, so we are now. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. It's way down the agenda. No. Never mind. <laughs> 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 um, okay. So. Does it make sense for us to? We have a lot of rules and policies, and I feel like we. Um, well, we have a bunch of things that are just referrals, that, so I think okay. we should be able to go through those quite okay. quickly. They're just being we're at, we're being asked to refer things to committees, right. um, so I think we can we can soldier through them. Right. Um, <laughs> the next one is a vote, uh, a transfer to create an ESP position. Um, Cami, did you want to speak to this one quickly? Sure. Um, so uh, student service department has um, the need for an, e an additional ESP since the budget was approved. Uh, we've had a student move in after the budget was done. Um, so we are requesting to transfer the funds from the out of district tuition account into the Bridge Street pre uh, preschool ESP account. And we're estimating $20,000 would be the salary for the year. Okay. Move to transfer funds to create an ESP position. Second. Second. Any, um, any discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, next we have a request uh, to ref uh, refer the matter of uh, physical education finance to the budget and property subcommittee. This comes from Ms. Busansky. Do you wanna make the motion and? Uh, yes, motion to refer the matter of PE finance to the budget and property subcommittee. Okay, second. Okay, great. Discussion? Uh, so we, uh, you know, our protocol is that we need a referral from the school committee or the superintendent to put an item on the budget and property subcommittee agenda. So it seems like we are deep enough into this new phys ed program that we should maybe stop and take a look at what is it costing us? What does the budget actually look like? Because um, as we've been ramping up, the expenses have been increasing and I could tell you more about it, but I can't really until we talk about it as a subcommittee, and then we could bring back any referral or information about it to you. So I'm asking for this committee to refer this issue to the Budget and Property Subcommittee. And during that meeting, we will also be able to discuss any other issues we'd like the Budget and Property Subcommittee to discuss. And so I invite all of you to let me know, as the chair of the Budget and Property Subcommittee, any issues you'd like us to be taking a look at since um, in advance of the budget. And I'd like to get this going now because I know that come yeah. January, February, we're gonna be right back into budget season and we won't have a chance to look at some issues. I'm not looking for any extra meeting time that we don't need to be meeting. Absolutely like to keep that to a minimum, but um, I want to bring this one forth. And then I know we have another one coming on its heels, the next request. Okay, excellent. So all those in favor of, oh, yes. Right. Sure. So by finance, what you mean is sort of costs. The budget of the budget implementing budget this of new the physical education plan that okay. we implemented. Is it three yeah. or is it four year? Are we in the fourth year now? We're in the third year now. We're in the third year now. Okay. Right, exactly. Does it matter that it doesn't say that there's is that just a doesn't matter. It doesn't say what that there will be a vote. On it says the vote budget. request to refer a matter of PE finance to the budget. Oh, mine doesn't. Okay. okay. Well, yours doesn't. No. Maybe you have the old version. Do you have the yeah, new one? This is the agenda? Must be the filtering software. There you go, Laura. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So there's been a motion. Question? Yes. Ms. Pizanski. The question. So you can you just clarify what your request is from us? If we have ideas, how how do we go about sharing those? Like, uh, that's a good question. Could huh. you email ideas of budget issues you'd like us to consider that we'd like to sort of generate in this next meeting ideas to bring back to the school committee to refer to budget and property so it's a little bit mm -hmm. cyclical. Right. So well, we could talk about them now if you have an idea on the topic. I right? don't. That's what I'm wondering. Okay. If I do later, what do I do with that? <laughs> so I come to the meeting or I mean, what? Well, you could come to the meeting or you could, you could just uh, email it to one of the members of the committee or me or all of the members of the committee and we could add it to the agenda mm -hmm. to vote on whether or not we want to have it presented to be referred back to the subcommittee. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Some serious sausage making. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so uh, 
There's been a motion made and seconded to refer this item to budget property. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The matter is referred. Uh, next, we have a uh, request from Dr. Voss to refer the matter of electric school buses to the budget and property subcommittee. Do you want to make the motion? Sure. I'll make the motion to refer the matter of electric school buses to the budget and property subcommittee. Second. Okay. Men, men, that? No. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, we do all these other things besides school buses. We have people driving to Springfield for the, um, I mean, we know we've got the van now, but in the future it'll get replaced we, for the, you know, the um, ice cream pathway, mm -hmm. the emission pathway. And then, and, you know, we just heard about how we're going to have outreach workers going to preschools um, around the town. Vehicles. And what? Vehicles. Vehicles. You could say vehicles. So could we? Buses. So could I amend this to say electric vehicles, school buses, and other transportation? Um, and then, I'm, you know, I, I don't. You know, I assume that the city wants to do this also, and you know, the other <laughs> half. So you know, the other other departments of the city, and if there could be something about coordinating that, because there's some infrastructure that would be really good in terms of charging and stuff. And if that could be added in as well, so not just our school buses, not just our vehicles, but also a coordination with looking at coordination with the city about electrifying some of its transportation as well. Yep. Is that That's an amendment I offer. Is that part in our purview? Okay. Okay. Just, What's that? Is that part in our purview? Well, to coordinate. Not really. Talk. Uh, and you know, we already are. We already have a policy to replace vehicles. Yeah, so it would be so important to talk to the other It's just the things that like yeah. school buses are a little bit of a different animal because they're right. not well, they're separate contract available yeah. in electric and we're contracting with an outside. Yeah. Well, but we wouldn't go on the He was still here. So we'd have, that's that's fine. We can certainly no. do that. But anyway, I just, you know, Great. I think otherwise if it's too narrow. Think broadly. Job. You're yeah. recommending the committee think broadly yeah. if we yeah. actually get to talk about this. Yes. I have another amendment. If that's okay. okay, so why don't you just amend your um, In light of... Um, the editorial and the public speaker that have occurred since I asked this to be for this to be on the agenda, can I add that we also talk about seatbelts to okay. the school buses to my yeah. request. Thank you. Okay. Second that. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded um, to refer mm -hmm. the question of vehicles, including seat belts and, and on school buses to the budget and property committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have a request uh, to refer discussion of whether or not to participate in pilot superintendent evaluation process to the superintendent evaluation committee. Uh, and this is from Dr. Voss, and thank you for catching that, Dr. Voss, because we talked about it last yes. meeting, but we couldn't do it because it wasn't on the agenda. So if you want to make that motion. Sure. I will make the motion to refer discussion of whether or not to participate in the pilot superintendent evaluation process to the superintendent evaluation subcommittee. Second. Okay. Any discussion of this one? Uh, okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next we have the renewal of the legal services contract, and I believe Ms. Lamaka is going to give us some, some good news uh, about the concerns about pricing that we had last time. Correct. I've got a couple pieces of information for you. Um, so you I had asked a question about um, how much we had paid in previous contracts with the company, uh, Sullivan and Hayes. Um, so I did some research. I put my, for my piece of paper that just. So in fiscal 17. Um, the hourly rate for um, the attorney was $225. Fiscal 18, it was $232, which was a 3.1% increase. Fiscal 19, we paid $239 an hour, which is a 3% increase. And what they were proposing for fiscal 20 was a $245 um, an hour rate, which is a 2.5% increase. And after um, the mayor had inquired um, on the behalf of the city contract as well, they agreed to honor the same rate, which is the same $245 rate for both the city 
uh, Labor Council and the Schools Labor Council. They did the same thing on the city side where they came forward in like July and said like, oh, we want to raise our rates. And it's like, well, we just finished our budget and we just passed our budget. And so like you have to give us a little more notice <laughs> than waiting until after we pass the budget to say we want to raise our rates. So um, for both the city side and the school side, they've agreed to keep FY20 the same as FY19 and not have an increase and then come to us with a little more advanced notice about the kind of increase they want. And um, so that was the, I think that's where we are. Isn't it a three-year contract? What are, they, what are they saying in the third, in the second and third year? Uh, second and third year, um, they were looking at, when they had originally proposed it, fiscal 21 would be $255 an hour, and 2022 would be 265 So that was before that. So we could go back and ask them, or we could do a one-year contract, mm -hmm. if that's what the committee yeah. wanted to do for right now. So we can certainly just continue for one more year and then do a renewal, Correct. but with enough advance if you notice to, do to be that, able to work. It will go over the, yeah. the the city's threshold, so we do need to have a contract in place for this year. Mm -hmm. So how could we move to renew the legal services contract for only one year? Yes, yeah, subject to further negotiation on the out years. I think that'd be fine. That would be the two thirty nine for this year, or. It would be what we're paying this year already. Uh, what we just was that two forty-five. Uh, it was whatever the FY19 number. Two thirty-nine. Two thirty-nine. Yeah. So no increase. Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to ask them to give us a proposal well enough in advance so that when the superintendent puts together a budget, it can be incorporated into that and to, for discussion. We would really need it by December. Mm -hmm. That's when we start. No so can we request it? Is there a second on the motion? Second. Okay. We will request it, yeah. Yeah, by December, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we need to vote? Yeah. All those in favor? <laughs> <laughs> there seemed like there were other people who were still looking puzzled, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm puzzled that they don't realize that we've just enacted our budget. Anyway, that they haven't figured yeah. out by now that yeah. the timing is off and haven't. I but that's what's. Busy with some, there was something going on. That <laughs> I can't on. imagine. I don't know what it was, but yeah. Um, so, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Uh, Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, excellent. So, um, scheduling of October and November school committee retreats. This is uh, Dr. Provost, and um, and so this is purely administrative. In our or your rules for procedure, there's um, requirement that the committee meet twice a year for professional development slash retreat um, activities. We have not always done that, and we have been a little bit. Um, We've also run into other things that have compromised that schedule. I think the last time there was a retreat was about this time last year. So uh, this is a request just to see if there is interest to follow the rules of procedure. Can we get some dates on the calendar? May. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of time spent, since at least three of us won't be on the committee, if it's best scheduled for after January. I know that's a different year. But is that a motion to suspend well, our following rules? Oh, well, our rules is twice a year, year. Calendar year. Right, so it would be to suspend our rules. Yeah. yeah, it would be. And when was our last yeah. retreat? Yeah, what on? High school. It was it high school. It was November. Okay. So I guess the question is, the policy refer to fiscal year or calendar year? I don't know. It's technically not a policy. It's the rules for procedure. Right. So it would be... The suspension of the rules, if that was to go forward, it wouldn't be a change of policy. It's the Reed rule, isn't it? Yes. It's the Nat Reed rule. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying that was a rule. Yeah. That he had introduced. So I think the meeting is it's good. I think like one year though, it should be in the fall, and then the other year, just based upon the elections, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So certainly, we have the ability to suspend our rules of procedure. And it's more prudent to wait a few, couple of extra months knowing we're going to have new members then mm -hmm. it make more sense so it's up to you whatever whatever people's but you had some ideas about potential topics you had I actually didn't have ideas about potential topics if I just wanted to try to get some dates on the calendar because I know it's very difficult and we're all here in the same room at the same time yeah. if 
if we were to move forward with it, then what I would do is ask people for topics and to put things together. The one topic that has been presented to me by Ms. Bozanski was a budgetary um, retreat. Mm -hmm. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Just learning more about the, the <laughs> inner workings of the oh, budget. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a professional depth for the budget. <laughs> Education um, Finance 101. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yes. I would agree that, I mean, if that was what we were doing, it would make more sense to do it later when the new members are here. Okay. The challenge, of course, was in January and February, you'll be actually presenting them the real budget, so it mm -hmm. can be done concurrently with that, but yeah, mm -hmm. but that's that's fine, too. We, we could go ahead and pick a date for January mm -hmm. yeah, and say that it's going to be a budget, just whatever retreat. Mm -hmm. Good. And my thing is, I think all of us get sort of a briefing when we began a budget on the budget from, well, your predecessor, I guess, was the... Um, so it would be sort of a second pass at that, so a deeper dive into understanding the budget, but I'm open to... Yeah. And there will be, I'm sorry, new school committee members at that point. Right. Well, I was going to say, we could plan it for November, because it's, uh, even if it's a retreat, it's open to the public, and we could invite the new school committee members to get the budget portion done before they're sworn in. Yeah. So that at mm -hmm. least that's done, and then in January, schedule a retreat like post for kind of a goal-setting, yeah, organizational, retreat. whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that is still a possibility. Um, so are there dates in November that people would look at? Do we, do we have a... Uh, do we have a yeah, the 28th is open. Oh, yeah, that's not really going to work. <laughs> 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 we'll bring the dressing. And <laughs> Cranberry sauce. I apologize for pushing you this long walk along here tonight. It's a hard time getting online. I have my calendar. Okay. Okay. So we know that there's not a fourth Thursday available uh, in November. Um, it could be early December. I mean, it could be, you know, I don't know what we have. Do we, well, we don't want to do. Same joke. Same joke. Okay. December is better because November is such a short yeah. month. I just also add one thing because you know I'm weird about the rules is I don't believe I believe that that was a topic for discussion of incorporating that into the rules of procedure and while the rules of procedure for 2019 have not been uploaded the ones from 2018 do not indicate that we added the requirement to have it it was just sort of a general agreement where we said that we didn't want to prescribe for future committees, how many times a year they needed to do professional development, but we took it upon ourselves to plan it. So I'm all for planning it, but I just want That's the public great. to know it's not that we're not following our rules by not doing it. We're just. That's correct. It was aspirational. Yes, it was, and I really want to do it, but we're not. It's not in the rules of procedure, which we vote on every year. So. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Sorry for my. Okay, That's all right. So, hmm. so the other option would be, of course, we could we doodle could poll. you could do a doodle poll, so we're not all staring yeah. at our yeah. tonight. Yeah. And, um, Such a good idea. <laughs> well, I'm glad you least, thought of that. Yeah. If I may, we've at least narrowed it down to two weeks, which is was a productive use of excellent four minutes. <laughs> totally, totally. <agree. laughs> and so we have a window. One, it sounds like one before January, another after January. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, can I ask? Something sure. the same process. I, I, I feel bad about putting the onus upon Dr. Provost to do this coordination or to yourself for that matter. I'm wondering if we can come up with another model where perhaps one of us or two of us or the vice chair or we handle the the all the nitty gritty logistics and feedback and coordination of it of the PD. I just wonder if that idea makes sense to folks because I I don't, well, at least I'm, for the, I'm, I'm hesitant to put another thing on. <laughs> yeah. But for the budget one, I think that's going to be pretty much you're going to be, you mm -hmm. and Cami will be leading mm -hmm. that one. Maybe the next one, if we decide what the topic is. Well, have we decided what the We topic haven't, is? no. Right. So, I mean, okay. just the doodle poll, find, figuring out what the topic is, coming back and saying this is what we heard, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I'm, okay. John's fine Suggestion. with it. Okay, but sure. I would volunteer with a partner maybe to take that onus away from him. Here's a suggestion I'll throw out that might be convenient for all. Yeah. We could 
have two topics for that retreat. One could be the budget, and the other could be developing topics for the next retreat. Well, everyone's there. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, that would be good. Mm -hmm. and we'll have and we'll have new pending new members there, hopefully as well. So, um, okay. All right. So we didn't have to vote on this. So um, next we have a report from the superintendent on state mandates. This was the, the personal <laughs> message, so <laughs> if any of you went home and tuned in, here it comes. Um, for those of you who are uh, getting the documents online, um, it's, it's the superintendent's checklist that goes with this. If you're doing it on your phone, don't bother downloading the checklist because um, this is mainly verbal anyways. Okay. Um, this item comes on the agenda as a consequence of a DESE board meeting Molly Burnham attended. She was the board's voice in um, our opposition to the, one of the many expansions of requests for PVCICS. As we debriefed after the meeting, she shared with me that she was struck by the number of the mandates she heard the board discuss in the short snippet of time she was there. Um, this came at a time, you remember, when there was stresses expressed by many teachers about the growing number of mandates pl placed, placed on our staff. Um, and since many of those mandates come not directly but through the channel of my office or through the channel of the administrator's office, it was felt that it might be helpful to explain just how much of this stuff originates in other places. Um, honestly, the, the alt team is not sitting around thinking of new things for teachers to do. Um, to give you a sense of why the documents are in there, one of these is the superintendent's checklist from 1718. That was um, the superintendent's checklist are a list of mandates that the superintendent has to work through every year and certify to the state. That year there were 115 items on the list. Um, we have since, now I will say this, some of them apply only to charter school leaders, some of them apply only to vocational, so it's not quite that bad, um, but it's a lot of mandates. Um, we now have a commissioner who is really honestly and firmly committed to trying to give districts some relief from overarching mandates from the Department of Education. But even with him throwing his support and the full weight of his office behind it, the number of items on the superintendent's checklist is actually up this year. So. Um, there, that's just to say, not a criticism at all of the commissioner, it's just to say there are larger forces at play. The, above the state level, there's the federal level. Um, and so uh, as hard as we try to shield teachers and as hard as I feel the commissioner is trying to shield locals from unnecessary uh, mandates, it's, this is a monster that's really difficult to put in, into a box. Um, so. I just wanted the staff to know that I don't ask anything unless I truly believe that it's going to benefit students or it's something that's required. The thing that makes me sad is the list of things that require, are required keeps getting larger and larger. And so the th list of things I think I can reasonably ask for that I really believe in, that I think would be helpful for kids, become smaller and smaller if I try to make it manageable for staff. So I just wanted staff to know that. Um, I really do feel your pain on this. The 118 items are things on my plate, right? Those are things I have to do. Many of them are things that are things where I must have to assure that you're doing them. So, um, that's a shared pain. Um, so I just wanted to share that. I think um, there are many other ways we could get into this. I certainly don't want to go through all the items on the superintendent's checklist, but it's just an illustration of the problem um, and just a way of trying to bring some awareness to the fact that some of the things that impact the day-to-day -day operations of schools in a negative way are things that are completely beyond our control. Thank you. Any questions or comments about that? I just want to say that I did bring this up because I think that um, not only, you know, I know that teachers know about the state mandates, but I think that sometimes the, um, adults and guardians and community members, you know, don't know 
in the same, actually it's the same as like the budget, sort of having a conversation about the budget. It's just as important to understand the driving forces from the state and the federal government. And it's very easy, I think, for us also to add more without thinking about what is there. And it's a really big picture. And I think it's, it, it really is important for you also, um, Director Provost, to be um, reminding us, you know, when I think that we bring our enthusiasm of um, things to the table, it's, it's a very important thing for us to remember the balance that is having to be made. So thank you. So now we move into the report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, and Ms. Fallon uh, has some first readings, and then she has a series of second readings with votes that she'll be wanting to discuss. So I'll turn it over to the Chair of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Thank you. Um, and before we start, having gone back and watched some of our past month's meetings, I would like to maybe propose that moving forward, first readings be an opportunity for us to point out the changes that are proposed and to ask any questions that you need further information before the vote at the next month's meeting, but not to actually have a full discussion of the same questions and discussions for the first and second readings. Because going back and watching, I'm like, oh, that was kind of a waste of time. We just had the same discussion at both readings. So, um, so for first readings tonight, we have policy DFH fundraising events. Um, there's no suggested changes um, for policy DFC events reimbursements. Um, I think probably there's going to be a um, you know a pronoun amendment. But not on fundraising? Mm -hmm. Are we discussing them as a batch or are we discussing them individually? Okay, so I uh, you lost me here. You said there were no changes to fundraising, but you're saying Those there was a change? Uh, this one's DFH? Yeah, he's saying he wants to make an amendment. There will be probably an amendment to but, getting rid of his or okay, Not coming out of committee. No, and so that's, yeah. So my, my point is that I won't remember this next month when we go back over it, and so I end up going back, rewatching the movie, and so we have the same conversation twice. Okay. So. Do you have a question about it, though, Ms. Busansky? Sorry, I just was wondering if we're discussing, should you, are you going to go through them and then we're going to discuss each one, or are we, for the first reading, or so are we trying not to discuss it till the second reading? I'm a little confused. So if, if there are questions that people uh -huh. have? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, go ahead. Yep. No, I was just asking. Oh, that was yeah, my so that question. was kind of my thing. Was like, <laughs> like if you say, like, uh, you know, this concerns me, or why don't we do that? Yeah. Or you have more information that you need before you feel like you can vote on something. Mm -hmm. I think that that's great to bring it to our attention, but I feel like we don't need to have a robust discussion of it until the second. until the second meeting because I don't remember what we did from the last meeting to this meeting to make the changes anyway. So. It ends up essentially being Groundhog Day when you go back and watch the videos where we have I the same see. questions, amendments, and conversations, but none of us remember. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Okay. Gotcha. So I would, that's it's just a proposal. Obviously, yeah. you you guys can do whatever. We can. <laughs> I had a I had a wording sure. other than the pronoun that was one that struck me, but on the fundraising one, it, it just reads oddly to me that it says the principal of a school must approve or deny. It feels like it should be the principal of a school is responsible for approving or denying. The superintendent is responsible for approving or denying. That's all. Did you not want to hear that now? That's right. I'm that would be my point. Is that is such second. a good point, but right. I'm not going to remember that right. next month. All right. I take it back. I'll bring it up next but month. But write it down in your special book. <laughs> <laughs> You flagged it. You flagged it, and then next next month you can propose uh, okay. an, an amendment. Great. Yeah. Yes. Just to make sure I can follow. <laughs> it, this is very helpful. So if if it's a concept in these things that should be discussed, so maybe the public can weigh in, we should bring it up in the first reading. But if it's the wording of it, it can't change until the second reading. So if you're nitpicking at the wording, just wait till the second. Is that essentially? Yeah. yeah. Nitpicking? Yeah. yeah, or, <laughs> yes. Essentially, if you have a question, concern, bring it up now. If you're recommending I change something in a month, that would best wait till next month. Okay, gotcha, thank you. All right, should I go on? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the next up we have policy DKC expense reimbursements. Um, 
So the idea um, on the suggested changes for this was to align it with the um, city's policy. So essentially um, that um, personnel and school department officials who incur expenses in carrying out their authorized duties will be re reimbursed by the school department in accordance with the travel policy set forth by the city of Northampton. Um, and that's reiterated in the second paragraph. We also removed assistant superintendent, not that we don't need one, um, and then um, added in the mention of collective bargaining because obviously anything um, that goes into collective bargaining we're required to honor, um, and added the cross-reference of city travel. Um, it's so late, I'm not sure I can remember what my question was. Oh, I'm sorry, and we added the entire third paragraph directly from the MASC's policy. Okay. Because they updated their policy in 2016. Oh, so, the, yes, I remember your question. Just, so, uh, Dr. Provost, do you and uh, can't, do you two have a set, what are we calling it here? Uh, Travel st monthly stipend. Travel stipend. Yes, the many uh, staff who are required to travel between buildings as part of their job have the option of either getting a set amount. I think it's twenty-five dollars a month, 20. or is that correct? Twenty. Or um, actually turning in mileage and getting reimbursed, reimbursed at the at whatever the rate happens to be at that time. Okay, got it. I didn't realize that. It's just interesting to know. Okay. Are there any other questions? I have some nitpicky thing, but I'll save it for next month. <laughs> for it's an amendment, you mean like a change? Yeah, or it's a little language thing, but anyway, go on. DKB. <laughs> okay, uh, policy DKB, salary deductions. We essentially, um, the subcommittee is proposing that we eliminate all um, what the bottom, the last sentence that says that the school district shall not act as a collected, collection agent for an employee's debts except when it's required to do so by court order. Um, and we included the legal references, but then updated this original policy was so old that um, it was from 1978 and the contract mm -hmm. references were um, were very specific. So we just want to add as a contract reference, NACE collective bargaining agreements, individual employment contracts. So those are all the first those reading the first items. Reading. Now we have the second readings, which... Uh, yeah, so these are all second readings and votes. Um, first up, we have policy DIB, uh, types of funds, revolving funds. Uh, we, I would move that we amend it to read all revolving accounts must be approved by city council. The list of current revolving accounts will be maintained in the office of the business administrator and add the legal reference um, that's listed. You know that one? Mine wasn't open. Um, okay. Yeah, which one do you want to look at? DIB? I don't think they have it either. Yeah. Here's a hard copy. So do you guys, that one's actually one set, yeah. two sentences. Do you want me to read it to you? Go ahead. Can, can I, I just said question? very short. I, I know these because I'm on the subcommittee. But I can't find these. I, they're in our um, packet from the first last race. month. From last month, so Tuesday, yeah. August sixth. That's what I'm looking. I'm not looking at our best. Thank you. Okay. From I Penny. can wait. I'm they're all in there. Sorry, it. those didn't go out. In. I think go out. I guess I have a. I guess yeah. I may have one um, amendment to it, and that is just that it's really the the city council and the mayor approve those. It's really the city council is not. Independently approving those. It's so you'd like to process. add in the mayor? What's up? You want to add yourself in? Uh, I, I think it's more accurate actually, because <laughs> every financial order gets has to be recommended by me and then signed by me. So it's really not that the school committee is going right to the city council. So okay. I'm so trying to. So you're moving to add that first sentence that all revolving accounts must okay. be approved by city, the city council and the mayor. That's correct. Or by the mayor and the city council. It could be the mayor and the city council. Mayor and the city council? Yeah. I mean, it, it has to originate. It, it, it can only be, an order can only be put forward by me. Yeah. So either way, and then I approve you it. You can say by the city? No, that wouldn't that? cover it. Because we are the city, too. Yeah. Um, I'm just. 
yeah. throwing well, that idea out there, is there one word that would should, cover both? Should it say that must be approved by the city council when put forth by the mayor? If you're saying yeah, you're the only one who can initiate it? You're, you're not getting into that. Yeah. Yeah. I just think the mayor and city council or city council. Let's say the mayor and city council. I just don't want it to imply that, the, that, you're, that there's not. Right. Yeah, it's a two-step process. And that's so a two-step process in state law, not just by in the, in the city. So should it say must be approved by both the mayor and city council? I, I think just saying like be approved by the city mayor and city council would be fine. Okay, I would mm -hmm. second that. Okay. So that would just be to make it more, more correct. More should we vote on your amendment? Uh, I, I guess that would be great. Is any, any okay. all those in favor, please say aye. Aye, aye, aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, now we're back to the main motion. I'm not usually making amendments, so that somebody's <laughs> making them. Um, any other questions about this one? Okay. Is there a motion to um, approve the I, policy? I made something? it, yeah. Okay. But was it seconded? I think it was. Mr. Moore? I thought it was seconded. I okay. I'll second it. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it. It wasn't or it was? No, it okay, Mr. Second. Moore has seconded it. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right, next up we have policy DI, fiscal accounting and reporting. Um, the only change that we're suggesting to this was that um, we add um, an, uh, the word additional. So an audit of the school department's accounts should be conducted annually in addition Oh, well, that's redundant when you read it out loud. In addition, oh, the you're committee doing DI or DIE? Oh, am I on the wrong one? We're on DIE. Sorry, we're on DIE. DIE, as in die. Die, yeah. yes. Audits. Audits. Die. <laughs> uh, audits. Um, in addition, the committee may request an additional audit of the school system's account at its discretion. Uh, the committee will reconsider or will consider recommendations made by the it's auditor the for maintaining an efficient system for recording and safeguarding the school department's assets. Um, so I'm guessing there's an amendment. The amendment is to change the letter A to the yeah. word N. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would second, second that. that amendment? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to make it grammatically correct. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of good grammar, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> okay. Um, so that A is changed to an AN. Um, and now we're back. Care about the redundancy of in addition, they can request an additional audit. Nobody else cares? Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's right. You probably don't have to say that to you, the in addition, right? It's redundant, but I didn't notice it the first 11 times okay. I read it, so maybe it's, it's a, you're not that important. Up to you. Up to you. I don't think it's that important, but. Right. Okay. So what it's saying is not Give them redundant. something to fix in years to come. Yes. My mm -hmm. yeah. God. Future. <laughs> um, so has this been made, moved so and seconded? It hasn't been moved. Seconded. <laughs> Ms. Fallon? <laughs> She's done. Go ahead and just Sorry, I have out. to fix it. Now that it's brought to my attention, we can do it. I move to, um, to amend it to read uh, after the first sentence, annually, period, and then change it to the committee may also request. No, that's the same. The no, may you still think may request yes. an additional? Yes. All right, so we're just going to eliminate. Take out in, a, in addition and say the committee may request. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. additional. An additional audit of the school system's Anyone account. Else? Discretion. Okay, that makes sense. Second. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Okay, back to the main motion. All those in favor of approving the policy as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so. Okay, now we're on policy DI, fiscal accounting and reporting. Uh, we and added in or designee um, in two spots, the superintendent or designee. Um, will be responsible for receiving and properly accounting for all funds of the school system and then in the third paragraph that um, the school committee will receive periodic financial statements from the superintendent or designee showing the financial condition of the school department. Okay. I have moved to, yeah, move to approve as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Any questions about this one? Mr. Kaufman. So it seems like we are getting monthly financial statements. Is um, do we want it rather than being vague and saying periodic? Can we just write in monthly financial statements since that's what we've been getting? Isn't it? It is unless 
there was some other reason you would want something else sooner than monthly for some reason. Okay, but I mean, periodic doesn't, uh, doesn't to me, doesn't sound like it's giving us something tangible. So can we firm that up and just say with that monthly since that's what we've been doing? That makes sense. So I guess my only, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like to be overly prescriptive when I think about five years from now, a totally new committee and maybe they decide that these meetings are ridiculously long and they want to meet twice a month. Yeah. Well, then they could potentially have a, one of these financial updates twice a month. So I just, I didn't, that was, that's my only. No, that's a bit concerning. What happens if we, there's no agreement on what period is? Somebody says they go back and change the policy to be whatever they want it to be. Yeah, I think there's a, yeah, a lot of it's not about, the, it's, it's about, you know, you, the committee requests, you know. Um, I think the periodic is fine, partly because, you know, sometimes we don't get a financial statement. Like at the very beginning of the fiscal year, there really isn't, it would be pointless. It's kind of, we haven't done enough to, for it to matter very much. It just looked like the budget. We do quarterly on the city side, just that's like our, but that's something that standard employers wanted was like quarterly reports. But that's I, think, mm -hmm. I think periodic is good. It allows for enough flexibility so no one's going to violate it, but it makes it pretty clear that it should be happening on a regular basis as opposed to, oh, it's been a couple of years. Look at the time. You know? <laughs> and I think the next sentence kind of is the other financial statements um, as determined necessary by either the committee or the administration. So, I mean, I think that gives us the, the right to to say we'd like something more frequently, more information, more frequency, whatever. Yes. Is periodic the MASC word policy? That's what they recommend. So most school committees use the word periodic. I can tell you that. That's okay. I, 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 my sense is these are taken from MASC boilerplate language, right? Um, Ms. Fallon's checking the MASC database. While she's checking, I'll just say the reason I ask is because I think lots of people think about it for a long time, so I like to start with them and mm -hmm. see what they came up with, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Um, it's a little bit different. Yeah, so the school committee will receive periodic financial statements from the superintendent showing the financial condition of the school department. They say periodic. Um, we've been amending our language to include or designate um, so that that allows, allows for the business administrator to, to give us that information. Okay. So are you comfortable with maintaining the MASC language? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there a motion on this? I thought that was so moved. Okay, so it's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next uh, policy. D J A. D J A. D J A. D J A. Purchasing uh, authority. Purchasing authority. So. In this, we once again added in language for designee. We added cross-references to um, all of the other DJ um, policies, and then we um, added in language um, that the purchase of items and services will comply with Mass General Law 30B um, and will not require further committee approval except when required by law or committee policy um, because we do have policies regarding um, Purchasing. Okay. So I would move to um, approve the policy as amended. Second. Discussion on this one. Very done. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so DJA is adopted as amended. Next up, we have policy DJF, local competitive purchasing. Um, we're just asking to leave the contract, leave the policy as is, um, and add in the legal reference of Mass General Law 30B. Okay. Are you oh, sorry, I moved to amend the policy. Uh, approve the policy as amended. Okay. So been a motion being seconded. Yes, Ms. Um, very nitpicky. I think the semicolons probably should be commas 
You know, I looked at that too. <laughs> I would, They're not full sentences. Yeah, I would be fine with the, if you did. You make that motion. I make that motion. I I, I circled <laughs> three of them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. To remove supplied after supplied after specifications and after mm -hmm. system. So there's been an emotion to amend to replace uh, semicolons with commas. Second. What's that? Sorry, we were just telling. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Back to the main motion. Um, all those in favor of the uh, policy as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So DJF is amended. Next up, we have policy DJF. DJ sorry, H. DJ H contracts. Uh, um, this and this has been more recently re reviewed. It was reviewed and uh, revised in August of 2015. Um, and so there were no uh, changes recommended by the subcommittee. Um, so I would move to approve it um, as is or as presented. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? And this is the topic we were discussing at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> I, think, I think there's discussion, but I don't have a solution. Okay. <laughs> so I think where this was difficult this past month was just in the timing of how things came about, and maybe that's unusual and we don't need to worry about it, but that was where it was yeah. difficult. I think, you know, I think that when I was thinking about that discussion, the, um, back at the beginning of the meeting, um, I think it's, it is a thing, it, this, this whole thing, it, it, you ba it basically it, it assumes that the, a, a committee member can, can block a contract if they think it's important enough. And so, you know, all those various <coughs> considerations would come into play, the size of the contract, what it's for. Um, you know what your what your concern is, and and um, and 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 again, how much you trust the people who are requesting it. You know, so right. So so all those sort of things come into play as to whether or not you want to have it be a thing that is discussed at a meeting versus saying, you know, I think that makes sense. And I and, and you know, you might trust a person more with less money. You might trust a person, you know, um, more if you know that the thing that they're asking for is something that fits in in the bigger picture that you know about. Um, you know, all those all those kind of considerations and I think this 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 policy allows us as individual committee members to weigh all those things and decide whether or not we think it's you know makes sense to say no we're going to hold up the process. And you could do it even in, in, again like you found it was like oh I don't really want to throw off this whole training over you know this this amount you know over my concerns well that's that's perfectly legitimate on the other hand you know if you were really concerned you know like and I don't mean really like I mean if it was a big enough concern you'd say it doesn't matter we, we can scratch this training happening because it's so bad <laughs> you know what I you know in terms of the problem I'm seeing but that's the kind of weighing we do all the time, all the time. So anyway, I think I, I think this. I think you're right. The policy can't solve the problem. It's, it's up to the people. Um, well, two things. I think it's just important to clarify that it's not about blocking the contract, right? It's just if you right. have a question or a concern, right. you want to put it on the agenda. Yeah. Nobody's talking about really blocking any of that. We, we, any one of us has the power to yeah. block a contract. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But. And then secondly, I just wonder if there's something that might just be clarifying, and I, I, you know, I agree with what's been said in general, but maybe at the end of that first sentence in the second paragraph that, uh, or something about, I don't know what the language is exactly, but the contract has to come to us with enough time that we could put it on the agenda before it's being implemented, right? Because that's really what... Things happen. Right. I think of course things happen, absolutely. And sometimes things happen just one-off. This is just, you know, what we're... I think that's kind of embedded in this in a way, but maybe it's just worth sort of saying it, right? Otherwise, why would it be here if, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. So I just, I just wanted to say that, of course, that's always been my practice. I mean, in, of course. in many cases, the contracts go out weeks or months before anything gets done. 
This was a very special case because we got a ruling from Joe Cook that came after we were already up against the training deadline. That's the only reason that it happened. So I just want to be clear about that. I don't, I don't know if a, that type of situation can be anticipated by a policy. It certainly is not the type of situation I wanted to be in either because, yeah, you know, I know, I know. Then I, I spent the next 48 hours thinking, are we having this training or are we not having the training? Right. I was just going to, I do appreciate what you're saying. I, I mean, we revised this policy to make it possible to have this process where you would send it out by email because we were running into that problem where contracts needed to be signed and, you know, we would get them the day after we had just met, so we knew that it was going to be a month before we could even vote on it. And I think this is the first time in four years that the timing was this bad and that it came up unexpectedly. And so I think that I'm comfortable with the policy being what it is and that, you know, if it, it is, it's a lot of pressure. I understand what you're saying. Like to make that decision on short notice puts everyone in a difficult decision, but I don't think we've been in this position before. And I don't, I don't have a problem with, um, with maintaining the policy as is. So, yeah, I, I think what made it hard, and I, I figured this out as the, you know, we had a nice email exchange as I was trying to understand some parts of it. Um, what made it hard is a lot of the previous ones that came were results of competitive bids, and those feel really different than when you get something with, with almost no scope of services in the contract and no competitive bid, and it's a lot. It might not be a lot of money compared to our whole budget, but it's a very much, it's a large amount of money for the number of hours in the contract. And so to not be able to talk about that, um, that's, what, that's what made this whole situation a perfect storm of, of things that it was hard to deal with. And so that's where I, I look at this, and, and I, I'm cognizant it's late and maybe there isn't a solution, but something about it being, having no bid in it was part of the problem. Can I just yeah. clarify though? Because yeah. I'm pretty sure, are are we only allowed to send out by email ones that aren't competitively bid? Right. If as I read the policy, well, it says if it's competitively bid, then it that's has right. to be voted on by that's the right. school if committee a, to award to the low bidder. That is correct. The one exception to that has been the time when we had a problem with the bid opening for the bus, and so and then, then you authorize. Yeah, but that's that. But I'm just saying the base policy is. If it's a competitively bid, we have to actually vote on it at a school committee meeting. It's only right. non-competitively bid contracts that can go through this email process. Because That's if they're below policy. a certain threshold, they don't have to. Go ahead. Um, so what it comes into is, right now, the bid threshold is fifty thousand dollars. Right. You have to formally go to bid. You have to have sealed it's bids come 50. in. Has to be advertised by state law. Anything less than that. Over 10,000, you get three quotes depending on the category and the exemption of what the category is that you're actually purchasing something for. So that's where it, it's technically not bid, it's quotes. And you don't have to get quotes if it's exempt. And quotes could be sending an email to somebody saying, send me a quote. You send it out to a couple of companies right. or you make phone calls and go, hey, this is what we're looking at doing. Are you available? What's your, what would you charge us for the day? Mm -hmm. They may not even respond, but correct. But you've, at least but you've solicited quote. three quotes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Bisansky. Well, I and I don't feel terribly wedded to it, so I, I'm. But I, I mean, I think it's implied in this second paragraph that we would get the contract in a time in a with Definitely. enough time to put mm -hmm. it on the next. So why not just put it into the paragraph? I guess just make it explicit. But I could, you know, whatever. It is late, so yeah. I don't feel completely strongly about it and obviously this is was in a, one exception in the four years but um, that's all just thought it might be clarifying what, what would you what would you suggest um, just, just I don't know I have to think about the language but something about having the contract come to the committee with enough time that it could be placed it, as an item on the next agenda, something like that. But, yes. but that kind of defeats the purpose of the policy, which was to allow contracts to be executed without having to wait for a committee meeting. Because mm -hmm. you know, we're going to hit a deadline 
for putting items on the agenda. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Burton. Can I make a suggestion? Because it is 10 to 11. Um, could we either vote on this or pass it back? I mean, it doesn't sound like there's like a, it doesn't sound like there's a deep, I just think people just want to express the concern. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Did you have any other, Mr. Kaufman? Sure, I don't, I don't um, think this is policy, but I'll say it anyway. I think in this particular case, and to prevent this from happening in the future, I, I know that if I'm going to get a contract similar, the timing is not a part of it. If I get it asked to look at something like we got, I will probably be concerned, and I will probably ask it to come to the, to the school committee meeting, and I, don't, I just think that's a waste of time. But that's my only leverage. So I, I think that the, the solution for me would be to get more information when we initially get it, or else I'm just voting on something that is alarming to me with the amount of money and the limited information that goes with it. So I don't know if I'm really advocating for more policy here. I would just think that maybe off the record or somehow, if you agree, Dr. Provost, we can speak to what would satisfy, in my mind, me, and maybe that would be everybody, but more information would prohibit this from happening because I understand the downside to it as well. Dr. Provost. Yeah. So, um, as you know, you get the standard city contract for each of these, and then you get a short um, blurb for me explaining what the contract is. Yeah. A process that many members have used when there have been questions or requests for more information that's in that is an email to me. And there have been many times when someone has said, uh, can you give me more information? And then when I've provided it, they felt like their need to get more information was satisfied without requiring it to to go on an agenda for discussion with everyone. There have been other cases where people have said, okay, well, that's the information, but I still think I want to discuss it at a meeting. I'm just pointing out that it's not a binary choice of either vote right then with that information mm -hmm. or wait till the next school committee to get more information. You do have the option to have some some discussion in that, that time frame. Within the four year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has this been moved? Yeah, seconded. Been seconded. Seconded. Is there any other discussion or desire to amend? If not, all those in favor of approving policy DJH, do you say aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? On to DJ. Yes, next up we have policy DJ purchasing. Uh, we would like to change um, the uh, mentions of his or her to there and then add in or designee this policy initially had the purchase limits um, of at one point of four thousand dollars and we'd like to um, replace that with city limits so that we don't have to worry about updating this every time the city updates its limits um, and this was also revised um, in August of 2015 fairly recently so I would move to approve it as um, amended. Second. Okay, we've got a motion made and second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, on and to last DK. Last one is policy DK, payment procedures. Um, so, yeah, there are a few changes um, that just reflect our practice. We worked on this with um, with the business um, manager and um, says all claims for payment from school department funds will be processed in accordance with procedures, not regulations, um, and that payment will be authorized against invoices and vouchers that are properly supported by approved purchase orders um, added in uh, or designate so that the um, the committee receives lists of bills for payment from the school department funds, and the list will be certified as correct and approved for payment by the school committee or designee. Um, and then, yeah, it was just a mm -hmm. replacement of, in, uh, of a long, wordy clause with ensure. And then in the last one, we um, would ask that the school business building administrators manage the budget rather than just observing it. Um, <laughs> and added in the legal reference of Municipal Modernization Act of 2016. So I would move to approve policy DK as amended. Second. Um, 
Um, oh no. Just a minor point. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just wondering um, what it's going to be. You know, what's that? <laughs> what it's going to be, so I have an answer. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. It's not a problem. It's just we we um, the city has changed the tr treasurer um, to the treasurer collector. Um, we have a city. We combined okay. our treasurer collector, so her title is actually the treasurer collector. So just to conform to that, I just. Um, so are you making I'm making an amendment that we change it to city treasurer slash collector. Um, Second. Okay. You have to ask them to vote on that amendment. Did you second it? I did. Okay. And I want you to make All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed the abstention. Okay. Back to the main motion. Um, yes, Ms. Ross. I have a question about the main motion, and it'll be the third paragraph. And um, crossing out "be responsible for assuring that budget allocations are observed" is a, is something I don't want to necessarily lose that meaning. Um, What's left there, I'm wondering if you've removed that sentence because you think the next sentence is the same thing or we're actually getting rid of that. So the next sentence says, ensure that, so the superintendent or designee will ensure that total expenditures do not exceed the amount allocated in the budget for all items. And as written, what that means to me is we have a budget, $30 million, we have to make sure we don't go over $30 million, but we don't have to, um, sure that our allocations are as they were put. So, so I'm worried about that. Yeah, I know. So that was exactly the conversation okay. our subcommittee had yep. for like 45 minutes. Yep. Um, and, and what we came down to was discussing with the business manager and the superintendent that the wording is actually problematic and that we do have to transfer between. Even just tonight, we just created a new position for a student we didn't foresee coming into the district yeah. who needed a one-on-one. -on -one. And so it's almost tying the, tying the superintendent's hands if if he can't make those allocations and we have other policies that you know limit how much movement he can do and from where to where. Um, and so that was the that was the rationale. But we certainly yeah, thought long and hard about that. And, and I think it's even more so because we have at the each school has its own budget and likewise, you know, we give the schools a certain amount of autonomy to to decide, you know, how they're going to spend their money. And, and um, you know, obviously the budget also we specify how it's going to be spent. So it's, you know, and, and it should be a plan that you can look at, but it's also a plan that's going to be changed by a variety, number of people will, will be having to change it in order to just actually adapt to what's happening in the building. So that was that was the yes. And even with grants coming in or being canceled or things not being funded, like there, as much as we want to think that we spend every penny exactly as how we anticipate it, there's so many changes. It's a living, breathing document. So so I totally agree with that, and I agree with the spirit. And what I'm concerned is, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're writing a policy. And maybe it's cross-referenced to these other things that limit the amount, but what I don't want to have is a policy that says, really all you have to do is not go over the total bottom line. And I think we don't, I think you're telling me we don't have that. Right. Yeah. Uh, transfers over $10,000 need to be, um, need to be ratified by the committee. Transfers that create new positions have to be ratified by the committee. The only time when transfers in excess of $10,000 are done without committee is during that last month of the year when we're trying to close the books. Well, actually, we do give you permission to do that. That's right. That's right. I need to ask uh, someone to make a motion to <laughs> extend our rules to go past 11 because it's 10.59. And we're motion to extend past 11. Is there a second? Ms. Burnham, I heard a second from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second it. Can we, we extend for 10 so. minutes? Uh, we could try. We had the same conversation last month, yeah. too. I mean, I just want to remind. I don't think we resolved it. We had to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did have it. We went we over the yeah. yeah. Okay. All those in favor of suspending rules to go past 11, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we didn't turn into a pumpkin, so it's 11. <laughs> so. Um, so are you are checking the math policy? No, well, so I wasn't, I wasn't. I was checking, so policy, it's That's budget transfer ask. authority is policy DBJ, and so maybe we should add that cross-reference? Is yeah. that what you'd like yes. us to do, is just add the cross-reference sure. to policy DBJ so that we know when those budget transfers are allowed to happen and when they need to have school approval? Yeah. And, and I think 
I agree we did have this conversation and thank you for checking on it because it sounds like you did and that's good. Um, so do, do you want to make that motion to? Yes. Um, well, let's well, finish with No, I meant Dr. Dr. Boss, Boss first. Yeah, Dr. No, Boss was That's no. fine, what you just said, I. Okay. I think it has to be an amendment. Yeah, okay. So amend, making a cross-reference and you just told me D, DBJ. D, DBJ um, add as a cross-reference. Thanks. Second. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Back to the main motion. Um, I mean, just, just yes. and we probably did discuss this last time, and I'm just not remembering, but does this align with the mask policy? This sources the mask policy, does it not? Do you remember? I don't It's a source, it says at the bottom, MASC policy, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. you, you guys did it? Says so. Yeah, well, so that's where it gets a little bit. So we did change the MASC. Oh, there's too many papers. We did change the regulations to procedures, right? Yeah. Um, that was MASC language that we didn't love. Um, the, the, so the regulations was MASC, and we changed it to procedures. Uh, let me look at the rest of it. Sorry. It's hard to do this when they're not next to each other. Um, and then, yeah, and so we also changed the um, salaries and salary schedules portion. You know, it's not identical. We've made it our own. So do mm -hmm. we need to amend so that MASC policy, I mean. It was the source. No, 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 no. It's, okay. the it's the source. source. It's just, we just the policy. policy. We just. Well, we modified it to fit what our actual practice is, too. For example, we don't. We no longer do the uh, every one of us signing uh, yeah. the stack yeah. of of uh, bills. Okay, I'm just curious about that superintendent. Okay, yeah. So those two, those. Insure. What we're changing is the MASC language. We are in fact changing that that sentence. The initial language for the last two. The superintendent will be responsible for ensuring the budget allocations are observed. And that total expenditures do not exceed the amount allocated in the budget for all items, and the and the school building administrators will be responsible for observing budget allocations in their respective schools. Sorry, that was the that's MASC. the MASC version that we yeah, are we are changing it to ensure and manage. That was our proposal. Right, the right. Committee. That's what I'm trying to understand. Okay. Well, if I can say part of it was to make them more active verbs. Yes. If you're observing the budget, you can be observing it going into the red. And, you know, you don't want the superintendent to do that. You want the superintendent to take control and stop that from happening. Okay. And likewise with, likewise with the building principles, mm -hmm. you don't want to just hand them a budget and say, mm -hmm. go implement. If they notice that they have needs in their building, you want them to say, no, I want to move some money around so that I can address the needs I have. Right. Okay. So, are we okay now? We've made the change. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? I believe that concludes the policy portion of our evening yes can i just comment sure. i think it's a much better policy so thank you oh thank you excellent um next we have a, a really quick business administrator's report <laughs> yes you do all right so put in your packet um our first financial report for fiscal 20 appropriations through September 4th. if you have any questions I'd be glad to answer them um gifts we do have one gift that we received um, from Melvin Hershkowitz for $836.08 to the Bridge Street School to buy some new office furniture for the school. Um, so we wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, that's cool. And you have... <laughs> it's against um, our policy. <laughs> two, two warrants um, that your representative signed for the month of August. Okay. And personnel report, I can just quickly report that we had in August 43 new hires. 27 transfers, 13 separations, and one leave of absence for the year. Can I say one thing? Yes. I, I didn't notice this until tonight. Under separation for third name and sixth name are the same name with yeah. two different days yeah. and two different years of service. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. I see. No, I see who it is. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Good catch. Okay. Does that conclude the personnel report? That's correct. Okay, then we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you. You know, just speaking from my heart for a second, I feel like I should just say, wasn't that amazing? I mean, you had so many members of the team come up tonight. Talk about the hundreds of thousands of dollars of competitive grants they've brought into the district. You heard the curriculum director talk about that wonderful pilot, the um, professional development we did uh, over the summer. You saw the teachers here giving of their own time and really genuinely excited about professional development. And I'll just say in the the discussion you had, you heard tonight, and also emails that I exchanged today, how many times today have you heard Northampton is one of five in the state receiving this honor, or Northampton is being looked to as a model for other districts, or the Department of Education is sending other people here to see how it's done. Um, just from the bottom of my heart, that is really gratifying for me, and I feel like things are really moving forward in a positive way in the district. But I do have a traditional report, so I'll say that. I'm sure that as well. Um, with the exception of the transportation issues, which I've been in communication about, the school is off to a, a very strong start. As those of you who attended know, we tried something a little different for convocation this year. The Ellen Malvezzi show was the high point for sure. As I said in my concluding remarks that day, the time to cry has now passed, and we're, it's time for us to laugh together. Um, later that day, the six units voted to ratify their contracts, so we opened school on a normal footing with happy people. Um, with the dispute over full-time release also resolved, our joint labor management teams are now back in action, providing opportunities for teacher and ESP input into critical issues such as professional development. Just before school opened, the Department of Education notified me that Northampton was not identified as a district with significant disproportionality by race and ethnicity with regards to students in dis with disabilities identification or placement or discipline. This finding is based on a three-year look-back period. During that period, we'd identified these as potential problems and taken proactive steps to correct these, these areas. Um, indeed, addressing disproportionality was an important reason for implementing our RTI and PBIS programs. I take this finding, or perhaps you could call it a non-finding, as an affirmation that our approach was correct and effective. So I'd like to take this opportunity to express my thanks to all who contributed to addressing potential issues of disproportionality in our district. Not only are we richer, thanks to the competitive grants discussed tonight, we are also a little larger this year. The total number of school choice students has increased from 199 to 210, and our total enrollment for the district has increased beyond 2,700 students. This appears to be our largest enrollment since 2014. The addition has increased not only due to school choice, but also the opening of the lumber yard, which has helped to boost our enrollment. As a consequence, our buses are even fuller than usual. We have several routes now with no available seats. And because of where students are placed, um, we are starting to think that for next year we may be needing to add an additional bus. Um, even reducing the number of bus passes we sell, we may still need an additional bus just based on student location and the time that's required to get from um, stop to stop to pick up all of our kids. So this is not a fully fledged recommendation, it's just something that I'm putting on your radar screen right now so that if it comes back in January or February, it's not a surprise. Our Twilight Academy opened this week with its first two students, one of whom may be able to complete graduation requirements as early as the end of the semester. We've been in discussions with VINs to assist us with childcare to help remove a barrier for Twilight students with young children. Um, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the traditional VINs mission, but um, the, the VINs director is really committed to helping us solve this problem so that students are not um, 
missing out on school just because they have young children they need to take care of. Um, and in fact, having the Twilight Academy model where there's shortened hours, it makes it easier for us to find potential volunteers to provide child care for our students while they're taking their courses. Um, so although there's nothing definite yet, I'm really happy to see that Vince has joined us in our efforts to think outside of the box to find solutions for students. The tech team, as you heard, um, both from faculty and students, is in the process of distributing Chromebooks this year, both at NHS and JFK, following a process that was developed last year at JFK, including meetings with parents that are now being offered at both schools. <coughs> there were some questions from older students who were not part of the process at JFK last year. Uh, the most common concern was why are we moving from our BYOD model at the high school to a single device model. The high school technology integrator has been meeting with individual students to help them understand the change of philosophy. The short answer to the question is that it's much more efficient for a teacher to share materials and facilitate learning if they have a single device in the classroom than if they're trying to problem solve issues that may arise if students are using a number of different operating systems and kinds of devices in their classes. Based on preliminary MCAS scores, we were able to identify our initial cohort of students for the new middle school math intervention. I want to thank you for supporting that. Counselors contacted parents at the end of August to enroll intervention candidates in the class and groups were up and running on the first day of school. Um, I actually observed the intervention group on the first day of school and the teaching was solid and the students were engaged. Speaking of observations, I've been able to make 16 school visits so far this year. Unless my evaluation team tells me otherwise, I don't plan on repeating the goal of making 100 school visits as I did in a prior year. However, as I mentioned at the end of last year, with some things coming off my plate, getting back into the schools is, more, is very important to me and I'm glad that I've been able to do that so far. These visits have included meeting with the faculty and staff of Jackson Street School and the high school to discuss the principal search process. Jackson Street families received a letter explaining their search last Friday. Similar communication went out to NHS families today. In summary, it's been a very productive and action-oriented first 11 days of school, and I hope the rest are as good as the first 11. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, so we have future business and meeting dates, September 23rd, 2019, Rules and Policy Subcommittee, Council Chamber, 6.30 p.m. The School Committee meeting on September 26, 2019, here at the Community Room at 6.45, and then on October 10th, the full School Committee meeting here in the JFK Community Room at 6.45. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The Thursday, September 12th, uh, meeting of the school committee is now adjourned.